G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the video begins, I would like to give Raid Shadow Legends a huge shout out for sponsoring this video. Raid Shadow Legends is a collective RPG game that is taking the mobile gaming landscape by storm. It provides an incredibly immersive experience, the best I've found on a smartphone, but if you're like me and believe in the PC Master Race, then you'll be pleased to hear that Raid Shadow Legends is now also on PC. You can switch between PC and your phone if you wish, which is great for train rides and trips away from home, and in my opinion, the best thing about this game is that it's totally free. Oh, and uh, you can also play on uh, Mac. Yeah. They also have this cool shard system in the game where you can choose to either level them up and use them, or if there's something that you don't want, you can sacrifice them to level up your champions, which in my opinion is a good system within the game because it makes everything useful. So, if you're tired of fluffy, cartoony sort of RPGs and want something a little more raw and dark, then Raid Shadow Legends won't disappoint. On PC, the game is super fast, has all the features you'd expect from an RPG title, amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. And you can find me in-game under the nickname Bee Buster. I tried Bee Buster Nut, but uh, believe it or not, it was actually taken. And if you're quick enough, you can also join my clan. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and if you're a new player, you'll get 100,000 silver, 2 clan boss keys, 10 mystery shards, and a free awesome champion, the Executioner. Check out this badass champion that they're giving out for free. And you'll find extra rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Good luck, and I'll see you guys in there. I was reading a story that reminded me of an event from over 20 years ago. In the second half of 1998, I had taken a job as a security guard at a plant that made locks. Being a kid, I usually worked one of three shifts, 4pm to 12am, 7.30pm to 3.30am, 12am to 8am. The 7.30 to 3.30 shift was for extra coverage, so there were always two of us there from 7.30 to midnight. It was a routine, boring job for the most part. We did our rounds, logged anything out of the ordinary, and watched a tiny monitor displaying the CCTV feed. And things went by in an almost painfully normal manner for six months. I worked, saved, bought a car, and planned to move. By late March of 99, I served my notice and prepared to head cross-country. A new hire was brought in to fill my spot, a soft-spoken man named Calvin. As part of his training, Calvin spent time working at all hours. That night, he was a shadow, working with myself and the other night guard, getting a feel for the plant's nocturnal routines. Most nights, he worked with myself and Amira, a female guard who was around my age. I was 18 at the time. Calvin, who was about a decade older than us, was quiet and polite, though something did seem to be missing. There's a spark that genuinely nice people seem to have, and he just didn't possess it. Whenever he went on rounds with me, he'd ask questions about the job and make small talk. I noticed that he was a, a little odd, laughing at odd times and changing his tone mid-sentence. At the time, I just kind of chalked it up to him being awkward. But that wouldn't last. So one night, near the end of his first week, he went on rounds with Amira, when they returned to the office, I knew something was wrong immediately. Normally talkative, she would barely say a word now. Not sure what had occurred, I waited until Calvin had gone to the restroom to ask. So, during their trip, everything had been normal until they reached the brass mill, a portion of the plant that shut down at 6pm. There were usually no employees there after that time and no lights. They were making their way to a checkpoint on a landing on top of a flight of stairs when the mood just shifted. She told me that she turned around, only to find that he was right on top of her. Startled, she backed against the grating at the end of the landing and he leaned in towards her, his face nearly touching hers. He flirted in a low voice and when she mentioned his wedding band, he said that it would all be over soon. 
From then on, I did the rounds, taking Calvin each time with me. The night ended without further incident, and I left a note for our supervisor detailing what had occurred. The next night came and went, though, with no Calvin. I did the rounds while Amira stayed in the locked office, and the same thing after that night, too. Then, on my second-to-last shift, I come in to find her freaking out because she found out why Calvin hadn't been at work. He had been arrested for murdering his wife. She had been dismembered and burned, parts of her body placed in a pond less than a mile from where we worked. That night and next, Amira called the jail to just make sure that they were still holding him. And based on the time frame, he had killed his wife months before he started the job. So this happened when I was 15 and out hunting with my father and one of his friends from work. His name was Frank, who was a lot more experienced with hunting than we were. It was an archery javelina hunt nearby to Crown King if anyone's interested. So we got pretty lucky coming up on a squadron of javelina as we were driving out to our campsite. So we stalked them for a little bit and Frank managed to get a shot on one but lost it in the bush after following a blood trail for a few hours. After our failed attempt of searching, we made our way back to our designated campsite, set up camp, and it was around three in the afternoon, so we decided to just call it a day at that point. That night, I lay in my sleeping bag with my father as Frank slept in a separate tent next to ours. It was a quiet night, which was to be expected, since the deserts of Arizona are usually very quiet. When I woke up around what I would assume to be like one in the morning hearing walking around our tent. Figuring that it was maybe just a javelina or maybe even a deer, I just laid there listening and waiting for it to go away. But one sound absolutely broke the silence though and scared the crap out of me because clear as day, right outside of our tent, you could hear a loud back, like someone saying the word back. It was aggressive and it caught the attention of my father who stayed quiet. The silence resumed again and maybe like 40 seconds later, almost like a recording on a tape recorder, we heard it again. In different circumstances, we would have walked out to see what was going on, but everything was just way too quiet. There was no struggle like a guy fighting a man or an animal, just this person yelling back. This continued for maybe another five minutes, with him occasionally yelling again, but soon the yells got quieter and we knew the man had walked away. I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night and just kind of laid there in silence looking at the zipper to our sleeping bag, half expecting someone to start to unzip it. But thankfully, that never happened, but it had been an hour before someone finally broke the silence. It was my dad, and he said, what the fuck? We didn't leave the tent till we could clearly see the sun in the sky before we heard Frank exit his tent before saying the coast was clear, him obviously being awake from the whole incident too, and he looked just as shaken up as we were. We started a fire and my father drank some coffee and we just stood there in silence, still trying to comprehend what we had just heard a few hours ago. Frank had finally piped up about it and he said, Well guys, I think I saw it thing had to be at least seven feet tall. Unlike our tent, Frank's tent was more for summer and made for a better bug net than a tent. You could clearly see out the top too since it was nothing more than a visor and that was how we saw it. After a little bit of thinking we decided to end our hunt there seeing how I was pretty shaken up by this and I didn't really feel comfortable about being out there. A few years had passed and I'm 18 at this point and my family and Frank had gotten together to talk and just hang out. And it was at this point that he told me something that he hadn't said on the trip, trying not to scare me that day. He said that when he saw it, its face was just pale white, like computer paper white. And it was at least seven or possibly eight feet tall. Close to 10 years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. 
live in her parents' recently purchased and refurbished home for cheapest chips rent so that the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year, but when they spotted this place, it was perfect so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with rando tenants for a year, so we were offered it. And we took it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the length on the left side, and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen, and a backyard. It was an inner Melbourneian suburb, so it was totally fenced in with six foot fence on three sides, and the front had a courtesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important for later too. So, my mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertical opening bay windows facing in the front garden and the street. I had the next bedroom with a window facing the gravel path and the fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months, I think, pretty much in total bliss. Great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a, a little bit dicey, the location was just stellar. Now, one hot summer's night, we said our good night, and I hit the hay and zonked out immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour before she heard a, a weird kind of scritch scratch on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized that there was no overhanging tree branch there. She sat, kind of frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, till she heard the noise again and again. Slowly looking up now, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open a window, looking her dead in the eyes. As she screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran right into my room, I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and kind of whisper yelling, you know the one, but someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little bit overdramatic sometimes, but I swear to you that I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunching sound of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunching continued, getting closer to my bedroom window now. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. Because my window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down and slammed the lock shut just as he reached that window. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized that he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was thoroughly shitting myself now, and my housemate was sobbing in the floor looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked, and ran back to my room, and immediately called the cops. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all of three minutes later, both lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the door a moment later, and the police identified themselves. Turns out, the dude had vaulted the back fence, an impressive feat, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, then asked if they could come in and take a look around. The cops were honestly amazing. But they managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe and I was just really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cup of tea which they politely declined as they took our statements and they asked if there was anyone that we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at her boyfriend's place for a few nights after that and when we stayed in the house it was just never the same after that. We felt completely violated and ended up moving out a few weeks after that. We never found out if the dude was actually caught, but 
Strangely enough, there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were very lucky that it went the way that it did. Whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty alone on the bus rides most of the time. I was always on one of those small buses. We did have other kids, but the highest amount of kids in the bus was probably around five or something, including me. I was the only one from my school on there, but all the other kids went to the same school. I should also mention too that I've had about four different bus drivers in my time, and the one that I'm about to talk about lost her husband about a year before and was out for a long time. Anyway, this takes place four or five years ago now. I was pretty young still. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids and we were heading to my school. And we were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused and I thought the bus had broken down. Being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything and I just kind of waited. My bus driver then randomly opened the door and I started to feel a bit uneasy for some reason. We weren't at my school yet, so why was she opening the door? And she was just staring out the door for like two minutes when I finally asked her, uh, Excuse me, are you okay? There's a man there, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills. But when I looked, there was... No man there or no person at all. She just kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and then just continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year and quite honestly, I kind of miss her. She was a very sweet lady, but that moment, I don't know what it was about it, but it still freaks me out. I sometimes think that the man that she was talking about was maybe her husband. I don't know. I don't know why she stopped the bus like that and opened the door for a stranger, but it was weird. I attended a, a pretty awful university in the UK. In fact, it was so awful that Vice even published an article written by a student that attended at the same time as me, titled The Three Years of Hell at the University of Wolverhampton. I lived in a student building in the middle of the city. Of the three student buildings available, it was the middle choice. But literally, it was situated in the middle of the three, and also figuratively, it was the middle, not as fancy as the fancy one, but not as unbearable as the worst one. Most of my friends lived in the fancy building, and to get there, I had to walk a small trek through a residential part of the city. But somehow, my friends found a shortcut. You could actually cut through and climb up at the back of the garden behind this uh, abandoned house, I think, to get there in less than half the time. And so I started using this shortcut all the time. Now, one morning, I walked around towards the garden and down to my shortcut and found three grown men just standing there. They all looked, for lack of a better word, thuggish and quite large. I uttered a small, oh, when I saw them and they looked up at me. A pale 19-year-old gay country boy with a blonde mohawk. I think that I apologized for barging in on what I was pretty sure was a drug deal, and I turned to walk back the way that I came and take the long way around. As I walked away, one of them shouted to get my attention. I ignored them, and then I heard them coming after me, so I started to run pretty quickly. I was much younger, slimmer, and fitter back in those days, so I managed to outrun them pretty easily and sprinted all the way around the long route to my friend's building, where they let me in. I explained what had happened, and no one was surprised. I mean, this was Wolverhampton, after all. A few minutes later, a friend of ours arrived. He lived at a non-university student building off campus and had to walk a different way to get to where we were. When he arrived, he asked me... Kyle, what did you do, man? I asked him why, and he said that an enormous guy had come up to him and asked if he'd seen a guy with a blonde mohawk, but my friend acted dumb, even though he immediately knew who he'd been talking about. My poor choice of hairstyle was fairly distinct. 
The worst part though, the guy was carrying a brick in his hand. It still gives me shivers all these years later, but it doesn't end there. So, me and my friends went out for a day out to Birmingham, bright lights, big city, whatever, and we didn't get home until late. When we got back to their building and drank until way after midnight, I started to relax and forgot my horrible ordeal from earlier that morning. At some point, more than a little drunk, I decided to head home. I was now pretty sure that I would never take the shortcut again, so I just took the long way home instead. As I was walking through the residential area, a car stopped on the opposite side of the road. And there were two guys inside, and the car was filled with smoke and just stank of weed when they rolled down the window to speak to me. I didn't have headphones in or anything, and I was the only person on the street, so I couldn't just ignore them or pretend that I couldn't hear them. The driver said, Nice hair, bud. And his friends began to laugh. Wait, mate, do you know where we can get some food? Uh, I don't know, I'm in the city centre, I said. I kept walking, trying not to show them how unnerved I was. They were facing the wrong way to drive alongside me, so the driver put the car in reverse so that they could keep pace with me. Do you know any places? Uh, a few, um, there's a kebab place at the top of the road, I think. Get in, you can show us, yeah? Uh, listen, man, I'm drunk and I'm tired and... I've got lectures in the morning, dude, I said, trying to sound casual even though I was just about ready to piss my pants. It really hadn't been a good day. We're going to turn around and come back and pick you up. Wait there, yeah? The driver said. As the car started towards the end of the road, which was a dead end, to turn around, I heard the passenger say, It's him. I know it's him. The car was far enough away, I broke into a sprint and ran back towards my building. I stumbled down the stairs and twisted my ankle pretty badly, but eventually managed to limp the rest of the way and got through the front door, just as the car drove past. I really dread to think what could have happened that day. And for the rest of my time at that god-awful university, I prayed to never meet any of those guys again. Fortunately, I never did. When I was a junior in high school, I was quite an odd kid. I liked having colourful hair, piercings and all that kind of stuff. And the school that I went to was near Atlanta, so there weren't many people like me. I tried to find friends that liked the same kind of music and other interests that I had. And I could normally kind of push off any weird energy that people put off. And just ignore it. Because I just wanted some friends. Anyway... I was in gym one day hanging out with a group of weirdos and there was a guy that I hadn't seen before. He was wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt and jeans that were like a size too small. His name was Ernest. We immediately clicked with each other in a kind of platonic way because we laughed at a lot of the same things. We started hanging out in the gym together every day, people watching and making fun of people playing basketball. And it wasn't too long until he started making fun of my appearance and making me feel absolutely terrible about myself. I actually had really bad acne, like super bad in high school, and he joked saying that I had meth skin. First strike. Me being me though, I kept hanging out with him, and eventually it led to hanging out after school as well. He would invite me over to his house, and we only stayed in his room. He refused to let me meet his family, his parents didn't really speak English, but I still wanted to meet them anyway. Plus, I always thought that it was a little bit weird that Ernest didn't know Spanish, but his siblings did. And when he would speak words, it sounded Russian. He pretty much only played It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia on TV and rambled about superheroes and would always come up with these strange scenarios where he was an evil villain and how much power he could have and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, fast forward a little bit and I get a job at a pizza place. Ernest gets the same job at this pizza place too. So, inevitably, we're always together. Like, always. 
He pretty much never let me out of his grasp, and it got to a point where he took me to school every day in his PT Cruiser, which I still get chills every time that I see one of those damn shoe-shaped ass cars. And it wasn't too long after this that we started skipping school a lot. I mean, we pretty much went to school about two or three times a week, maybe. This is where it starts to suck pretty bad, too. So, he started pressuring me to do sexual things with him. I don't really want to get into the details because it's pretty disturbing, but he manipulated the situation in such a way that I felt like we were in a relationship because I thought that I needed him. He really convinced me that we were a couple, but I was so repulsed by him that I never could fully accept that. He started telling our other friends that he had sex with me and that we were in a relationship too. I denied it all, and to this day I deny it. I've lied to therapists, and I've lied to my friends, but right now, I'm admitting to all of that. At one point, though, he ended up living with me and my family in the same room as me. He had convinced my entire family that he was gay, so he could live with me. He literally dressed up in pink and put a scarf around his neck and pranced around my aunt trying to win her over with his fake personality. I was so used to living in chaos that this was barely a problem for me. During all of this, he was such a rude piece of shit to me though. For instance, I remember asking him for a ride one day, I can't remember to where, but he said no, for no good reason. I started getting really pissed off because he couldn't actually give me a reason, and he just kept smirking at me. He did this type of thing frequently too. We were sitting in the living room one day and he silently got up and just drove off somewhere, came back, walked to the living room doorway, stared at me for 15 seconds and then walked into my room. I hear a bunch of rustling so I storm in there thinking that he's up to something sketchy and he's gotten completely dressed into his sleep pants with his hands in his pocket and he just wouldn't take his hand out of his pocket. At this point I'm kind of scared so I force my hand into his pocket and I pull out a knife and I don't remember how the night or the days continued after that but that was the first thing that really creeped me out. Fast forward again though and I'm at my best friend Kayla's birthday party and everyone's camping in the backyard. Ernest hated Kayla because she was way out for me, in his perspective anyway. She got in the way of us, apparently, and I'm sweating typing this out because this is probably one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. The sequence of events is a little bit blurry, but I do remember most of it. So, I made it clear to Ernest at this point in time that we were not a thing and that he needed to let go of this fantasy. I had a crush on this boy named John, and we slept in the same tent together. Morning comes, and... I hear Ernest outside asking people if they knew where I was. Someone said, she's in the tent with John. I was scared immediately and I knew something bad was about to happen. He begins screaming as loud as he can, cussing all of us out and just pitching an absolute fit and then he just storms off. He goes to his car and calls me and tells me to get in the car now. Everyone there was freaked out and Kayla advised me not to go into the car because she knew how scary Ernest was just as a person. I didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable, so I figured that if I went to the car it would ease everyone just a little bit, that he wasn't there. So I went, and as soon as the car door closed, we sped off, fast, and I mean really fast. I looked over at him wide-eyed and he screamed crying with absolutely no expression in his face. Tears streaming but completely emotionless. It was really weird. He says to me, you were supposed to love me, over and over again. And he starts speeding faster and faster and said, if I can't love you, then no one else can. I'm actively having a straight panic attack in this passenger seat. I can't hear because my ears are ringing and I can't see anything. Meanwhile, Kayla has already called my mum and somehow my mum left the house fast enough to track us down in the PT cruiser and he parks at a church and my mum is watching us and Ernest has a box cutter at his side. I get a call from my mum and I can't really remember what she said but I know it was something along the lines of, I'm going to kill you Ernest. 
He started coming to his senses after that, if you can even call it that, and drops me back off at Kayla's and tells me that he's going to end himself after he drops me off. Kayla and I are frantically trying to call his parents, but they can't speak English. In the end, though, he called the police on himself because he thought that he was going to harm himself or somebody else. He was gone for a couple of weeks after that, and when he came back, he was parked outside my school just waiting for me to come out. He runs up to me, and I noticed that he had on a, a plaid button-up shirt, and it was tucked into his pants, which was just extremely odd to me. And I knew immediately, too, that this was a completely fake personality. He was speaking differently as well, proper almost, like a few weeks had turned him into a saint. It wasn't long after that that I had admitted myself into a mental institution because I just kept breaking down. Everyone in the group told me to get rid of him and I would not realized just how serious this all was until I saw everyone's reactions to the stories. There are so many other stories too of this psycho, but... I really don't have the time to type all of them out. I will say that I did get rid of him and I found new friends and without them I really don't know how I would have gone. I haven't seen or spoken to him in about three years and I'm hoping to keep it that way. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And before the episode continues, I would like to give Stitch Fix a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, when it comes to shopping for clothes, I think most of us are pretty much amateurs. Well, I know that I am at least. So, why not let a professional handle it for you? With Stitch Fix, a stylist will do the work for you. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that delivers your favourite clothing, shoes and accessories directly to you. They have brands that you know and love, plus exclusive styles that you won't find elsewhere. After completing your style profile, your expert personal stylist will send you a hand-picked box of items based on your style and preferences. With Stitch Fix, everyone can look their best. They have solutions for women, men and kids all over the US and now the UK as well. With no subscription required, pick between automatic shipments or only getting new pieces on demand. Shipping exchanges and returns are always free and plus the $20 styling fee is automatically applied towards anything that you keep from your box. I've actually ordered some items through them previously and I must say that they really chose well and I was pretty happy with what I received. So get started today at stitchfix.com scared and get an extra 25% off when you keep everything in your box. That's stitchfix.com scared. Stitchfix.com scared. Once when I was about 12 years old, I woke up in the middle of the night needing to take a leak. I walked across the hall to the little bathroom, hit the lights and was about to reach for the toilet when I glanced up and saw a, a face in the mirror and it wasn't mine. It was as if someone was on the other side standing to the right with their face right next to the glass staring at me. I only saw it for the briefest moment but it's forever seared into my mind. I screamed and ran out of there to find my dad and of course, my dad investigated and calmed me down, or tried to. Eventually, we had a prayer session because I was so freaked out, and I must have gone back to sleep at some stage. Fast forward to my 30s, I'd forgotten all about the event. One night while visiting, my dad quietly brings it up, and he says, Hey, do you remember that one time that you saw the face in the mirror? It suddenly came back to me in a rush of memory, sending a chill down my spine. Yeah, I remember that. Well, he said, I sometimes think about that night. He looked down at the floor with a serious expression. Because uh, I saw it too. He went on to describe exactly what I'd seen, and we still have no idea what it was. Apparently when he investigated, he saw it and had a freak out of his own. Apparently the prayer session was as much for his own nerves as mine. And I respect him for keeping that tidbit from me to my 30s, but I kind of wish that he never had told me. So this is something that I share with new people that I meet sometimes, but obviously no one believes me. My family moved to a new house in 2011. I was 17 or 18 years old at the time. 
It's one of the first houses built in town, and it's very old. We found newspapers, in fact, dating back to events of Russian Revolution. And yes, I live in Russia. I must say that the house itself has different extensions built much later, and basically, the oldest wooden part of the house is right in the middle. In the part of the house that we own, or rather I should say apartment, we've only one wooden room on the first floor. When we moved in, I decided to choose that oldest said room, and I remember feeling like I just wasn't welcome there from the very first day. Quite honestly, too, I really didn't put much thought into it at first, but it very quickly got very spooky. So, I remember seeing objects move on their own, a rope crawling on its own underneath my bed while I sat on it, footsteps at night, weird buzzing sounds that I once recorded on a camera, and once, I witnessed a sheet of paper stealthily crawl from the top surface of the desk to drawers as I was sitting in it. It was evening and the desk lamp was on, but it didn't spook me too much, but it kind of made me indignant, like, what the hell? Is this for real? I grabbed that sheet of paper from whatever force was holding it, and I just kind of chuckled in disbelief. But each day, it just got a little more terrifying. And the two worst events that I remember go as follows. So, it's midnight and I'm in bed, just trying to fall asleep. And something's bothering me and I feel eyes on me, but my own eyes are closed. I decided to open them and I shit you not that there's a floating face of a man right above my bed. Thick eyebrows, angry expression, just a head staring at me and no body. We locked eyes for a minute in silence, and I was too afraid to move. Eventually, though, I forced myself to rush out of the room, and that night, I slept with my mum like I was five years old again. And the second one, I was actually having a dream, and I can't recall all the details, but all I remember is it was about a kid. A kid around eight years old, I think. Skinny, light blue top, and dark blue shorts. I remember drawing it at the time too because the dream just felt really surreal and anyway, I suddenly woke up and I thought to myself, it must be around 3am and I decided to check my phone to see if I was right and the moment that I flinched, I heard loud and clear someone running away from my bed towards the hall. Luckily, eventually I moved to the second floor, but it was probably the scariest year of my life. It seems like whatever it was, it kind of deliberately avoids newer parts of the house and for some reason sticks with the old. I don't know. But nobody lives in that room anymore and it's just a bit of a guest room now, so I guess that whatever's in there might be happy now. This happened to me a couple of years ago when my now husband and I were living in a townhouse in a pretty decent area. My husband was working third shift as a corrections officer at our local corrections facility and I was working as a waitress or a bartender. It was an unusually warm night for mid-March so I took advantage and decided to take my husband's 80 pound Alaskan Malamute Siberian Husky mix on a quick walk around the neighborhood near our complex. We get to the end of the street that leads into the complex that we live in, and across the street is a marathon gas station. I notice as the dog, Luke, stops to relieve himself, and there's a guy across the street at the gas station with a case of beer in his hands. I have my phone out, texting a friend, and looked back up to notice the guy was near the stop sign, also relieving himself on the sign. I felt really awkward and instantly put my phone away, and I led Luke down the street on our path. At this point, I think this guy noticed us too, and he crossed the street to where Luke and I had just been. I hear him walking a few feet behind me and just keep my head down, staring at my phone with Luke glued to my hip. After about 10 seconds, I hear this guy's steps getting closer. Luke realizes too that there's someone behind us, and he stops in his tracks. Mind you, he is a big dog compared to my 5'2 self, but I can handle him pretty easily, and he's very well trained by my husband but I noticed his ears were perked up and his tail was straight up. I was glad that he was aware of the surroundings, but I still wanted to keep moving and away from this guy. I don't know, I just got a weird feeling. 
This guy finally catches up though, so I tighten my grip on Luke's leash and pull him closer to me and step into the grass to allow this guy to pass us and keep Luke out of his way. But does this guy keep going and pass us? No. When I thought that he was about to pass us, I started out a small apology because Luke was pulling on his leash, a little to investigate this guy, and most people did get intimidated by him just by his size. Like I said, he's a pretty big dog in my opinion. But the guy stops and just kind of stares at me for a minute. Long enough for me to smell the cigarettes and the booze rolling off of him and to notice that he's probably in his mid to late 20s, dark hair, scruffy looking and just kind of really dirty. He smiles though and then finally seems to notice Luke trying to get to him and asks, Cute dog, what's his name? Instead of making up a name, I just said Luke. He then proceeds to ask me if he can pet my dog, and before I can even give him an answer, he leans down to start petting Luke's head, and Luke did not like that one bit. Luke jumped at him as a warning, and the guy backed up, kind of chuckling. I apologized and mentioned that he was very protective, and made up a lie that he was trained as my dad's former canine unit, my dad is a software developer, by the way. But instantly, I saw this guy's face change. I don't know what to call it, but he looked a, a little bit put off by that. He asked me what my name was, and I gave him a fake one. He then asked if I lived around here, and I said that I was visiting a friend of mine for the weekend. He then made a sudden step towards me, and I'm not lying when I say that I have never heard my husband's dog growl in the five years that I've been with him, but the sound that came from my dog sounded like something straight out of a horror film. Luke's hair was spiking on his spine now and he was throwing himself up on his back legs and kicking his front legs at this guy. He had put himself completely between myself and the guy and was now snapping at him. This freaked the dude out so much that he stumbled backward, nearly dropping his beer. He quickly said, Well, have a nice night, cutie. And then just stumbled off down the road. When I say my heart was pounding, it was deafening and I grabbed Luke's leash so hard and sprinted between the buildings until I got back to my townhouse and locked all the doors and collapsed by the front door. Luke was in my face the whole time kissing me and whining. This dog is the sweetest and most gentle creature that I've ever met and hearing him growl and seeing him react the way that he did made me realize that... I needed to get out of that situation and fast. So I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers and even often picked up hitchhikers, solo and in groups, and get them where they needed to go. When I was 19, I had moved to Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar at the time. My shifts would start around 9pm and end at about 2am. I didn't really know anybody in this town or state even and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so at this stage. So on one of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me, being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his 30s or 40s, buzzed white hair with a group of other guys, all of them tattooed with leather jackets. Nothing against leather or tattoos, I have and wear both in fact, just giving a visual detail. Now, he'd been there going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar, pretty much talking to me non-stop for a good couple of hours. Around 1.30am he mentions that he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious, and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right though, not one of his buddies was in sight. He says that they must have all gotten drunk and just forgot about him, leaving him there. The man is clearly bummed and quite concerned because, as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from here and has no way of getting home now, and it's the middle of winter so it's snowing pretty hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone calling different friends that were at the bar with him but no one is answering. He's pretty clearly screwed and I can't leave him in the bar, I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow either, so fuck. Now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place that I'm unfamiliar with, in conditions that I've never really driven in before, no snow in my home state. 
I tell him don't worry though and when I finish clearing the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. We get in the car and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been for quite some time. Just some superficial conversation. Nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person at the best of times, so I'm positive that there was no misunderstanding here either. Keep in mind too, it's like 2 in the morning. No one knows where I am, or that I'm with this rando, and it's snowing heavily now. And as we're chatting, I suddenly feel this hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. It was truly such a, an unpleasant feeling. I remember his finger swirling in the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make into sort of a ponytail. Ugh. I scrunched my neck though and just calmly said, I have a knife, as I kept looking forward driving. The swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again calmly, but more firmly, I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figured whatever that was is handled and we get back to our conversation. Minutes later though, I feel his hand fully against the back of my neck again, his fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, seriously, I have a knife. He removed his hand once more and then in a very hurt tone, he said, are you really scared of me? After that, he kept his hands to himself and it was a long one hour drive. But I did get him home and after that I took off. I'm 29 now and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me the whole thing was probably a setup that he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick that he's been talking to all night will have to take him home, opening the door for sex, consensual, or maybe not. I guess the moral of the story here is don't let people you don't know into your car. Oh, and uh, also, always carry a knife. So, this happened years and years ago, and I was young, but I've asked my grandma about this incident recently. My grandma is a big road rager and likes to cuss and flip off and pull around people all the time. It's gotten better in her later years, but this was in 2014, I think. My grandma didn't tell my grandpa and I this story until it actually happened. So before we get into that though, here's some background about how I knew the mum and the kids. The mum was really sweet and I was in her son's class in elementary and I walked past her all the time on the way to the buses while she was waiting for my classmate. I also had daycare with all three of the kids and I can't say that I met her boyfriend or ever saw him since I was young and I was in my own world playing with friends but once in a while just walking past her she asked if I knew where my classmate was since he was running late and I stood next to her and played with the youngest while she waited until I almost missed the bus. Anyway back to the incident. So my grandma is a big road rager and on her way back from work mostly because of rush hour she was going around a roundabout about the only one in our town and pretty new and a car behind her kept honking and riding on her bumper. She finally got sick of it because she was focused on trying to get around this new roundabout while having someone on her bumper and honked her horn for a few seconds while at a stop and flipped the car off. She watches this guy in the mirror as he gets out of the car and cracks his knuckles while speed walking up to her. He's cussing her out and she recognized the look on his face from past incidences with not too nice men. She was on her own though and her car required her to manually lock the doors and trunk and roll up her window. She basically said screw this and sped around the stopped cars in front of her which was really dangerous because of just how narrow it was and just got off the roundabout. A month later though they're watching the news while I'm in my room and my grandparents start talking. It was a small house and I could hear them at least muttering. My grandpa yells for me so I get up and I go back to the room. Hey, don't you know little Johnny from school? My grandpa asked and I nodded feeling confused and wondering if something happened to him. My grandpa plays the news story and he says, Do you know his mum? And the news told the whole story of how the man strangled her to death and posted the pictures on 4chan and the caption that, if you don't believe me, watch the Washington News Channel at about so-and-so hours, her son will be home then. 
It was the oldest son that discovered her nude and dead, and I had a few interactions with him before because of daycare and whatnot. And honestly, my entire heart just hurts thinking about it. My grandma sat up when they showed the boyfriend's face, and she realized it. That was the man in the car behind her. And I mean, he even looked recognizable to me as well. Probably because it's just a small town, and I may have seen him at some stage. But she told us the whole story, and even just thinking about it sent shivers up my spine. He could have been slowly breaking just then, and that's why he raged out like he did. I'm just really happy that my grandma got out of that roundabout when she did. I'm not saying that he would have killed her or anything like that, just that he was already a woman beater and dangerous, so who's to say that he wouldn't have at least hurt her? I did talk to all three boys at one point or another that year when I would find their Instagrams. I don't think that I talked to the oldest though, but I tried to get in contact with just no luck. My classmate really didn't want to talk about it, but I tried my best to console him out of doing stuff. I don't want to put in too much detail about the kids, just for respect for them. But the youngest ran a whole account for his mum and would post just about the same picture every time that he was missing her and I think he even wrote a book about it, although he was only eight at the time. I have no idea where they are five years later, but I don't think they're in PO anymore. But let me finish by saying this. The mum, she was really sweet and her boys were good kids. None of them deserved it and I hope that that guy rots in hell. So I was about 16 years old and at that time very interested in ghosts, paranormal things and stuff like that. But my mum is, uh, I wouldn't say uh, a medium or anything, but highly esoteric and can see things in and around other humans. For example, she can feel bad energies and also describe dead loved ones of her customers standing beside her perfectly. And if you want to hear stories of my mum, just let me know but her being so sensitive of those things did wake my interest even more. So I went online and researched on ways to communicate with spirits and energies and whatnot, and found out a way to do so. I invited my sister and two of our neighbor's kids to help and watch. I didn't want to do that alone because of obvious reasons. But we waited for my mother to leave because she prohibited specifically to ever communicate with the other world. But we wrote letters and numbers and also yes and no on a paper, cropped them out and arranged them in a circle. But we basically crafted a Ouija board. We lowered the shutters in my room. Yes, we did that in my room. Stupid, I know. And lit candles and placed them in different places in my room. Me and my sister placed our hands on a, an upside down drinking glass and the neighbor's kids watched from the bed. The first few times they laughed and chuckled when we said phrases like, is someone here who wants to talk with us or if you want to communicate please do that. But after a few minutes, a few of the candles started to flicker and I didn't think too much about it because, I mean, candles do flicker. But after some more time, some of them really started to freak me out. They started to look like someone trying to blow them out in fact. You know like when you want to blow out candles but don't use enough air so you just blow the flame in one direction? They looked a lot like that. And then the glass started moving. I looked at my sister and she looked at me, simultaneously asking if the other one was pushing it. We both got really freaked out so we took our hands off of the glass and that freaking thing moved all by itself. I got a panic attack and we all screamed and ran to my door to get out. We had actually closed it before we got in. In hindsight, it was a very stupid idea. But I pressed the handle of my door down, but it just didn't move. Not an inch. My sister and the neighbor kids started to help pressing it down and we leaned on it with all of our body weight, all combined, but it just didn't move an inch. And then the candles started to go out and we just screamed and screamed and eventually it opened and we ran into the kitchen in a corner and we just huddled together and cried. After that we eventually calmed down and things kind of went back to normal. From that day on I never slept well in that room too because I just felt watched all the time and my writing desk chair started moving on its own as well. I placed it under the desk and the next morning it stood a good meter away from it. My mum also noticed that my room just didn't feel right. 
like something lurks inside of it and asked me if I did something stupid. Eventually I told her and she was furious saying that I could have brought much more evil in our apartment than a spirit that amuses itself by disturbing us. She set a ritual in my room saying a few phrases and putting a protective circle around it and smoking it out with sage and whatnot and after that I was never disturbed by it again. Nevertheless though I won't be doing that again. So, before I get into this story, I know the generic answer to these stories is sleep paralysis, and although I do have that issue sometimes, this, this is definitely different. So when I'm on my way to sleep and I finally find a comfortable position to lay, I usually can only sleep if I'm faced towards the middle of the bed. This thing will come up and I can feel my bed react to something climbing onto it because it sinks down a bit. It then proceeds to just kind of lean over me and breathe as close to my face as possible and I can literally feel it. When I don't react to that, open my eyes for instance, I can feel it get off the bed from behind me and get back onto the other side so that we're face to face. I know this because I can feel the bed react again to it getting on the other side and now feel the breathing right in front of my face instead of over me. Plus, you know when someone gets really close to your face and you can feel the heat coming off of their face? I can feel that too, and lastly, with still no reaction from me, it gets off the bed again, but I know it's still there, just from that feeling that you get from someone staring at you. Now, like I said, I know that there's a lot of people who would think that, of course, this is just sleep paralysis. The whole story is pretty generic to exactly that for the most part. But this is why I don't think that that's what it is, because I can move. I'm not immobile and it doesn't feel like anything is holding me down. I know that I can move because I'm so used to sleep paralysis that I know how to check for it as this is how I usually transition to a lucid dream. That's a whole different story. Also, the way that I sleep, I have one hand under me, usually under my pillow, so I just open and close my hand a few times to confirm that I can actually move. This works for me in my head because if there is something there, I can move a little without it knowing. I then move my legs up to get into a fetal position just to make sure that my feet are not hanging off the end of the bed. Too many stories regarding that. But now that I know that I can move, this is where I start to get nervous because now I have to actively try to keep my eyes closed since I've confirmed that I'm actually awake and it seems to be right in front of my face at this point. I can literally feel the sweat coming out of my pores and my entire upper body because I'm just so nervous. What I've done the last few times when I know it's not on the bed anymore and I'm drenched in sweat to the point that I need to move off of the sweat spot, I just say screw it and I jump up from the bed and yell as if that's going to do anything, but when I do though, of course, there's always nothing there. I'm 31 years old and this isn't new to me. I have a theory that it might be related to a lady that sometimes haunts my dreams. Since I was in pre-K, that's another story for another time again. It also has crossed my mind that it could be my dad. That's actually worse than the first option to me. Again, another story for another time. But anyway, what do you guys think this is? And can you shed any light on the situation? It was an October night at about 9pm and I had spent a long day working as a hostess at a restaurant. One of my friends had asked me to help them out with getting a lot of liquor for a party that was being thrown. Because I didn't really have time to get it all in one shopping trip, I went to three different liquor stores in a matter of three days, one each day. I ended up spending $180 on the liquor altogether. They said that they would pay me after I got it because they had no idea how much all of it would cost and that they would even add a tip, which I was fine with. At the first liquor store that I went to, I hauled out the rest of the order to my car and this liquor store is in a very suburban area, so I felt completely safe and I'd been there countless times. As I'm putting the liquor into my trunk of my used cop car, I see out of the corner of my eye two men looking around and walking towards me. I act like I don't see them and mind my business, but keep my peripheral gaze on them because I never fully let my guard down. Hey, could you give me a ride home? One of the men asked in a black hoodie. I said, 
I'm actually very busy tonight and I have stuff that I gotta do when I get home. I'm trying to be as nice as I can, I add. There's a light rail just over there though and it's also where buses circulate. He came back at me with, Well, uh, I don't really know where I'm going. So I told him, Yeah, there's some maps over there by the light rail to show you its path. He just looks at me with his friend and then... They pull up bandanas over their faces, only revealing their eyes, and he pulls up his shirt, which reveals a gun in his waistband. I'm so stunned that I can't respond. All that's going through my head is, oh my goodness, my parents are going to kill me for getting this car stolen. Eventually, his friend says, I don't think she thinks we're serious, man. But put the gun to her head. He put the gun to my head, and this wave of shock hit my body, and it just doesn't feel real. A couple of seconds pass and my brain sort of starts functioning again and I hand over my keys. As they're trying to figure out how to get into my car, I just kind of stand there frozen, not able to comprehend that my car is being stolen by these men for 10 seconds. They take a good 30 seconds to figure out how to turn the car on and learn the controls, and while that's happening, I'm just standing still as a rock because I'm thinking that they're about to shoot me if I started to run, but... Then, my mind tells me to run because they could take me with them and hold me hostage or god knows what. I was holding my purse which had my whole life in it and I know it wasn't a good idea to do this but it was so convenient. It had all my medications, money and everyday things that I need while I'm doing stuff. I was trying my best to keep it out of sight in the back of me. All of these thoughts are rushing through my head for the next 20 seconds when, all of a sudden, another man runs out of the store as the car is driving away and he hops into the back of it. While I watch them drive away quickly, I slowly walk towards the liquor store and as soon as they're out of my sight, I start running to tell the liquor store employees about the incident while my body was shaking. I tell the store manager, lock the door, my car was just stolen at gunpoint. This man then has the audacity to ask me, what if we have customers? The employee, freaking out, runs towards the door to lock it, yelling, Oh my goodness, what? This never happens here. This is crazy. What happened exactly? I try to tell her why my body was shaking, my voice was shaking, and I start tearing up because of the shock. As I'm telling her this, she picks up the phone and she tells me to call the police right away. Now, the police come in less than a minute, and I give them my statement. The man that I told the story to says... Yeah, this sort of thing happens a lot unfortunately and it's very rare that we find whoever's done it. It's hard to determine what will happen to your car as well. We'll just have to wait and see. Which makes me feel so much better about everything. I tried calling my mum, father and brother. No one picked up as I cried. I laughed a little bit because of course this type of thing would only happen to me. Although he had work early in the morning, I called my boyfriend because I didn't want to ride home in a police car. I needed to be with someone that I knew and could talk to about this with. When he picked up, he'd been asleep and got annoyed with me at first, but then I explained the gist of what had happened so I'd be able to explain and go more in depth in person. In the end, he didn't actually come in time, so I got driven home by the cops and he met me at my house. Shortly after we got to my house, my parents got home and were in shock hearing about what had happened. We all sat around and talked about it until my boyfriend had to go home to get a proper amount of sleep. The next day, I decided that I had to drop my class that I wasn't doing well in to begin with because there was no way that I was bouncing back after that. I just needed some time to recuperate. I told my friend about all the liquor that was stolen, and by that I mean all $180 worth of liquor was stolen. And they told me that they felt so bad that they put me through that and I just told them, look, it's not your fault but I just spent $180 of my own money for you guys and as long as you pay me back for it, I'll be fine. There was a good amount of people that were chipping into this party and some of them didn't even want to give me money because they believed it wasn't their fault that I was dumb enough to get my car stolen so why even give me money for liquor that I didn't have. Eventually, they scraped up the money, though, and they paid me back a couple of days later. Five days later, they found my car ditched on the side of the road in the city. I had my car thoroughly cleaned after the incident, and I picked it up. And when I got my car back, I realized pretty quickly that these men had stolen everything. Even my expensive textbooks that I'd left in my car for school that I was going to return. I pushed down all my emotions for so long that a week later, 
I kind of had an emotional breakdown and I still am not the same after this whole event. So this may not be that bad compared to many others but a man has followed me around the store five times now and for background I can only really go to the store late at night around 9 or 10 due to my job. I know it isn't safe but I always carry a taser or pepper spray on me for things just like this. I'm also only 5 feet tall and pretty petite. He's probably at least 6 feet tall and over double my size. So it started sometime last year. A man walked up to me while I was in self-checkout and started asking me typical questions, like asking if I had a boyfriend, telling me that he noticed me walking around and he needed to tell me that I was pretty, things like that. I lied and said that I had a boyfriend just for my own safety and took the compliment, and I didn't think anything weird of it. Until it happened again and again. Every time he used the exact same script in the exact same order and always finds me in a very closed off space. The first three times he never even had anything in his hands to buy. The second time that I was sitting on the floor of the makeup aisle totally vulnerable he said the same thing as the first time and I politely told him that I still do have a boyfriend but thank you. And that was that. I just thought of it as kind of coincidence. The third time it happened though, I was in the very corner of the store by the vegetables with nobody near me. He says the exact same thing as the first two times, so I finally had to tell him, you've come up to me three times now, every single time you've talked to me I've told you no, I need you to leave me alone, do not come up to me again. The fourth time it happened, we passed each other and he realized it was me, so he circled around and followed me into the medicine aisle and pretended to look at the bottles. Every time I took a step to the side, he would too, and at that point, as soon as I saw him, I called up a friend so I would have somebody that could hear what was happening and try to scare him off. I turned the corner and I could hear him calling out for me, so I started walking faster. Believe it or not, I ended up running into a police officer in uniform, and even though he was busy and I felt bad for interrupting, I asked him for help. The officer walked me to the self-checkout when the man actually had the nerve to pick the counter right next to me. The officer walked me out to my car and I could see the guy was watching me in the parking lot. But the last interaction happened just a couple of minutes ago. So I was looking for something for dinner and walked out of the frozen food across to the makeup. And guess who walked past me at the same time? We crossed paths and I kept walking and checking over my shoulder. He was still watching me and I freaked out a bit and I hid in the makeup aisle and poked my head out and sure enough he was looking up and down the aisles to see where I went. I texted my mum and a friend because I didn't know what to do and when I saw him turn I went to find a manager but I could hear his keys following behind me. The manager walked me to the checkout and once again he picked the counter next to mine. The manager walked me out and he trailed behind me and again, watched me get into my car. I did a couple of circles to make sure nobody was following me and drove home. But I've got to ask you guys, am I being stupid and just overreacting? It's happened five times now, and after the third time it happened, I reported him to a different manager, and he told me that if he's ever in the store again, he'll be removed and banned, but that particular manager wasn't there tonight. So, where do I go from here? The officer that helped me even told me that, unfortunately, he couldn't do more than just walk me out. I know I shouldn't go so late, but it's the only time that I can, so I don't know what to do. So this is a, a bit of a weird one. Years ago, I worked in a supermarket in a small town. It was a pretty hellish place to work, so many of the employees banded together and were really friendly with each other. One of my co-workers, Ben, wasn't the kind of guy that I would usually be friends with, but he was pretty funny in a kind of quirky, offbeat kind of way, and he helped make the day go faster, so it was good. He and I were still friendly with each other, and when I left for an office job, he hugged me goodbye on my last day. Cut to several years later, one of mine and Ben's mutual friends posted an article on Facebook and said, I can't believe I used to be friends with this piece of shit. I read the article and 
my stomach just turned cold. It was a news story about how Ben had gone to prison for aggressively murdering his infant son and then tried to cover up what he had done. I was pretty disturbed and couldn't believe that I had once been friendly with someone who could do such a thing. Even more years passed and I moved to a different county and a different job. I now work in an office that has a warehouse attached. I work in the office but the warehouse has a, a really high turnover. People leave or are fired, get hired all the time. And one day I hear the office door open and the guy says that he's come to start working in the warehouse. It's the first day and I look over my shoulder. And to my horror, I realize this guy could be Ben. He looks older and rougher than the last time that I saw him, but it could definitely be him. I ask for the new guy's name, and yep, it's Ben. I didn't want to spread gossip or start a panic or anything, but I felt that I had to say something. Many of the office employees bring their children to work some days, and even though I doubt Ben is now in the business of just killing random children, how do I know what he is or isn't capable of? I spoke to the warehouse manager, who was horrified to learn the truth. I showed him the article about what Ben had done, and the warehouse manager told me that Ben had lied in his application and said that he had no criminal convictions. He was fired immediately and was escorted out of the office. This is a, a bit of a long one, but bear with me. So my mum has always had spirits or haunts in her life, but most of them bad as well. They seem to follow her right from childhood and every house that she lived in, and this is just one of those stories, but there are many, many more. My mum and I were out shopping one day, and we ended up at a local thrift store. They had this deal where they showcased upcoming items behind glass, and if you liked something, you had to come back for it the day that it would be going on sale. This was a big attraction because, well, of course, they showcased the best items that they had donated to them, and on the sale day, people were lined up at the door to be the first one to buy a coveted item. So, we were looking at the items on display, and my mum pointed out a porcelain doll, a clown. I looked at it, and immediately, my whole body shuddered and became goosebumps. I've always had a bit of a sixth sense for these things, and this clown gave me a huge case of the willy. I told her it wasn't a good clown. My mum was completely enamoured with it though. I warned her that I got a bad feeling from it and please don't buy it. But two weeks later, I went to her house and I ended up on her back deck and sitting in one of those deck chairs was that damn clown. I went inside and said, Mum, how could you? I told you that thing gave me the creeps. She told me that she was drawn to it, so the day it went on sale, she headed up to the store early and stood in line. And no one else seemed interested in it, so she took it as a sign that she was meant to have it. I asked her why it was sitting outside, and she said that my nephew Jay was seriously weirded out by it and begged her to get rid of it. Jay has lived with his grandmother his entire life, and at the time he was about 16 years old. I asked Jay about it, and he asked me if I liked it. I told him the truth. He said mum wouldn't get rid of it, but did put it outside. He also said, You sense there's something wrong with it too, right? Did you notice that no matter what direction you're looking at it from, it seems to be looking back at you? That definitely had gone unnoticed by me. But fast forward a week or so though, and I noticed the clown was no longer sitting in the chair outside, so I asked my mum about it. She said our entire family was hating on it, so she got rid of it. I felt somewhat relieved that it was gone, but the house just felt different. Being she was touchy on the subject, though, I just kind of dropped it. But that wasn't the end of it, though. So my mum was also raising my niece Amy, who was just over a year old at the time. I would go over to visit, and Amy never wanted to be in her room, and I would go in there to grab some toys and... She just wouldn't walk over the threshold. She just stayed in the hallway and when I asked her to help me to take the toys into the living room, she would just shake her head no. I thought that she was just being that age and I left it alone. But then she became suspicious of an antique wardrobe that sat in her room. When it was bedtime, I would take her in and she would stare at it warily and then she would look at me, put her finger over her lips and cryptically say, shush 
and point to the wardrobe. And after that, she didn't want to be left in her room alone, so bedtime became difficult trying to rock her to sleep while she fussed. Another week passed though, and my mum called and asked me to come over. I said sure, and I drove to her house, and she said something really scared me last night. Now, she'd been in bed for only about five minutes, laying on her side, when she felt a heaviness descend behind her onto the bed. That tired feeling left her immediately as she became hyper alert. She wasn't quite sure what to do and was trying to decide when a male body came up behind her and pressed himself with his erect penis into her back. It put its legs over her and an arm around her torso. She froze in fear, not quite knowing what to do and trying to comprehend what was going on. She knew that she had locked all the doors just moments before heading to bed. So had someone come into the house with evil intent? She said that she put her hand on the man's hand that was over her torso when her finger felt very long and pointy fingernails at the end of its three fingers and a thumb. She could feel breath on the back of her neck and she knew that it was waiting for her to make the next move. She struggled to get up but it held her fast and wouldn't let her move. She knew that she had to think quick and she mustered up her best pissed off voice and firmly said, let go of me. He just pressed harder and held her tighter though, but louder this time, with real anger in her voice, she said, get off of me you bastard. She kicked and struggled and finally it let go of her. She jumped out of bed, immediately flicked on the light to find nothing but her empty bed. She looked on the other side of the bed, underneath it, in the closet, everywhere. She even went through the entire house checking her grandkids' rooms before looking in every closet and cranny in the house, only to find that no one else was there but her family with the door still locked from the inside. I was obviously shocked. I didn't know what to say. My mum has never been one to make up stories, especially like that, so I really had no choice but to believe her. I knew she hadn't dreamt it, but I also just didn't understand why. But I'm also acutely aware that spirits seem to follow her and our entire family from house to house as well, so this wasn't totally out of the ordinary for our family. Another week passed with odd things happening. There'd be a mug placed on the kitchen counter to fill with coffee, but when Jay turned around with the pot to fill it, it was just no longer there. He would look around and finally find the mug down the hall in the bathroom or something, Amy also would not enter her room without an adult, then cower while pointing at the closet or the wardrobe. And there were constant oddities like that, but things finally came to a head one night. So my mum called me in the morning again and asked if I could come as soon as possible. She sounded quite frantic, so I headed over immediately. Amy was watching a kids program in the living room, so my mum could speak to me in the kitchen. And she said something really bad had happened the night before. She was sitting in the living room, getting Amy ready for bed, when she heard a loud slam against the wall down the dark hallway where Amy's room was. They both immediately became stiff and stared down towards her room. My mum said that whatever was coming down the hall towards them made a, a loud flapping sound that got louder the closer it got to them. My mum hugged Amy to her tightly as a pair of enormous black wings came barreling at them, then paused at the entrance to the stairs by the kitchen, pivoted, and loudly shrieked as it spiralled down the stairs into the basement. Stunned, my mum and Amy sat there for a moment, not moving or saying anything. Finally, Amy wriggled away from Grandma, cautiously made her way towards the stairs, and looked down. And when Amy turned to Grandma, she pointed down the stairs and whispered, Shush. And my mum all but lost it. Amy slept on the couch that night while my mum slept in her easy chair and my mum was shaking by the end of the story and she had tears in her eyes. She said to me, I need you here because I have to do something important. She went down to the hallway to Amy's room and I heard the closet door open. And when she came back, cradling the clown doll in her arms, I swore at her. Amy saw the clown and ran to me frantically saying shush 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 and was crying in fear. My mum said that she needed to take the doll out front to throw it out but first she was going to smash that porcelain head to bits. When she went outside Amy clung to me in tears. 
My mum knew that Amy was going to need me when she went outside with the clown. Again and again, my mum slammed the clown's head against the pavement. But no matter how many times or even how violently she did it, it just would not break. After many attempts to shatter the head failed, my mum defeatedly buried it in the garage can that would be picked up the next day. She couldn't do anything else at that point but just have it gone from their life. Later, I asked her why she kept it, and she said that it just felt right buying it and she absolutely adored it, but the rest of us were creeped out by it, with good reason, obviously. She said that she put it at the top of Amy's closet one day when Amy was at daycare, and she had covered it so that it wouldn't be seen when I went in there. I hadn't seen it, and neither did Amy, but I definitely felt something was off in the house every time I went over she had assured me that it was gone, so I trusted her, but Amy felt it too, and was scared by what resided not only in her closet, but also in the wardrobe. Jay felt it and experienced strange things as well, but nothing compared to those black wings and the thing in my mum's bed. Needless to say, all the weird stuff, it stopped after that. My mum has always trusted my intuition, and hers was certainly off that day in the thrift shop, but I always say, we always choose what's familiar to us. When you live in haunted houses your whole life, that becomes your normal. However abnormal that may seem to others. And the normalcy my mum felt when she saw that damn clown felt good somehow. No matter how much the rest of us felt, the evil it possessed. This happened in my hometown when I was 7 and I'm female, 36 now. For context, I lived off of an island off the coast of Washington State in a military town that is among one of the safest places to live in all of the US. But, as you guys are probably all aware, weirdos are everywhere. The timing is vague for me, but since I was outside playing with my friends, it's likely that it was a summer evening just before dinner time. We were screwing around, riding our bikes in the street, just running around, the usual kid stuff, when a car pulled up and stopped in the middle of the street. I don't remember exactly what the man driving it said, but he must have beckoned me over there because I know that I walked close enough to hear him. He asked me if I'd seen any other kids wandering around because his were missing. I noticed then that there was also a woman in the car with him, so I assumed that she was the mum and he must have been the dad. I said no, that I hadn't seen any kids wandering around, but that there was a park nearby around the corner and you might be able to find him there. No, too, that I was super proud of myself for thinking of this at seven. The man then asked if I'd be willing to get into the car and show them where the park is. Although I didn't understand just how dangerous this was, I was well aware of the whole stranger danger thing, so I said no. He asked again if I could please get into the car and help him find his children at the park, and I said no, sorry, I can't do that, but I gave him directions to the park and then I skipped off to continue playing with my friends who were standing there just watching the whole time. And after that, he drove away. A few minutes later, my mum came outside to call me in for dinner and I bounced happily up the driveway to tell her how I'd help someone. I was very excited at the time to have done this for an adult, which will bring me to my final part at the end of this. And then I explained the whole thing to her. Her face changed a bit, but she just nervously said, That's very nice of you, hun. And I felt a surge of pride. And then my dad came home. Solid Navy dude, black belt, used to be in the pararescue, and so badass that Chuck Norris checks under his bed for my dad every night. And my mum obviously told him what happened. And his reaction was much, much different. He told me that although he was proud that I liked to help people, that I was never, ever to approach anyone that I didn't know like that again. He said, and I'll never forget this and have since passed this wisdom onto my daughter. Remember, adults should never be asking children for help like that. He told me that I was lucky and that I hadn't got snatched and to always remember it because they would have lost me forever if things had gone badly. He was very stern, which hurt my little ego, and I lost a tiny bit of innocence that day. And now that I had 30 years of knowing my dad, he was only stern because that's his reaction, 
meant also anger when he gets scared. And I mean, the poor dude, before that I had escaped as a toddler and was found on a cliff in Japan and then I left the yard another time in San Antonio to sell my colouring book pages door to door and I'm sure that he was wondering what fresh hell he was in for this time with a child like me. To wrap it up though, I don't remember if my parents did anything with what I had told them, but it's almost 100% likely that they did because they're pretty solid loving folks. To my knowledge, however, nothing ever really came of it, and I never heard about any instances like that again. When I was around 13, me and my dad went on a canoe trip. It took three days, but it was a pretty calm river and, honestly, quite beautiful too. The first day was just amazing and fun all the way around. The sun and the water and nature and it was an amazing time. Night came and we took up shelter on a beach for the night. As we sit by the campfire, I see the water in the river splashing. Remember, it's almost rapidless and calm and I tell my dad and he looks and says that it's probably just some fish. I think, though, that it's multiple monster fish, if so, because these splashes were huge. We finish up and retire to the tents. In the middle of the night, I wake up to reposition, and I swear that I hear a girl and a guy talking. It's faint, but nobody should even be close to us. It's not that loud, and I shrug it off and eventually go back to sleep, just thinking that maybe there's some other people out here. Next morning we head out and again it's a great day and I swim and relax in the beaches and not a person around but dad. We eat lunch at the beach and continue down the river and as it hits about four or five in the afternoon my dad tells me that we need to consider finding a good spot for the night. And minutes later I notice a girl on the bank in a tree but she's like at the top and the tree is huge. It freaks me out because... We're in the middle of nowhere, and who sits in a tree 60 feet up, just chilling in this remote area? Anyway, the night comes, and some stuff occurs, and we eat and start a fire. It's about 10pm, and we're going to turn in, and I hear cracking sticks off at the wooden edge. I glance over, and it's the same girl from the tree. I instantly freak out, and I tell my dad to look, but by the time that he looks, she's back in the tree line. I'm scared so I ask to sleep in his tent and he agrees seeing how spooked I am. Night goes by uneventful besides the constant limbs breaking which was more than the usual but not anything crazy. Maybe I was just uneasy, who knows. But the final morning arrives and we load up to leave and I realize that the fire is smoldering. But I soaked it with buckets of water and it appears that there's more wood in it now. This kind of sketches me out more, but the last day, so I just say to myself, let's go. We load up and start going down the final eight-hour canoe ride. Afternoon was fun doing the same stuff. Got to two hours to load off beach and I'm checking out the scenery and my heart just drops because on the beach in full view is the same girl beaten and bloodied up. Very rough looking. I make eye contact as we pass by and this time my dad sees her too, clear as day at this point. He starts paddling faster, we get about 10 or 15 feet ahead and she screams the craziest and just scariest scream that I've ever heard. She starts running down the bank beside the river and she's like unreasonably fast. But we're paddling hard and I'm screaming but we can't gain much ground even with the current. We get even with her again and she stops running. We keep paddling like our life depends on it and as I look back to her, she's now stopped on the bank and then she slowly starts walking into the water without reaction until she's just completely under. We paddled fast as humanly possible upon seeing that and the last two hours took us like only 30 minutes. I don't know if she was crazy or a ghost or... I don't know, but I'm never going back there ever again. So a couple of months ago, me and my family of four, plus two dogs, moved house from living in a village to living in a small old farmhouse. 
The new house is a 10 minute drive away from the nearest town, so it's not too far, but it's, it's one of two houses in the area. The other's house occupants were in the process of moving out, so they were rarely home. With hardly anything surrounding it apart from fields and one tucked away house and one road connecting us to the town. A few days after officially moving there and unpacking most of our stuff, my parents had to go out to work. Their jobs usually mean that on weekdays I have to wait until they finish work for them to pick me up and drive me home. On weekends, this means that I stay home unbothered until around evening when my parents get home or my brother wakes up. He usually sleeps for like 16 hours at a time due to his crowded schedule or something. Don't ask. On this particular weekend though, my parents decided that after work they were going to visit a friend's house on the other side of the area. My brother was home, but he was determined to stay asleep and told me not to bother him under any circumstance. So basically, I had the house to myself for the whole day with no jobs or work to do, apart from like walk the dogs and stuff. But anyway, so around 6 in the afternoon it was already getting dark outside. Not so dark that you couldn't see anything, but dark enough that anything you could see was basically just a silhouette with vague features. I was watching YouTube in my room upstairs when I saw the headlights of a car slowly making their way down the very long road towards our house. And my first thought was that something was wrong. But then I realized that the car was probably for the one other house next to ours, whose occupants were just moving out and coming to collect their stuff or something. But due to me not thinking much of the car, I just continued watching YouTube in the end. Not even two minutes later though, I hear my youngest dog sounding off downstairs. And I instantly get the worst vibe I've felt in a long time, so I decided the best course of action would be to go downstairs and investigate what was causing my dog to bark. But since no one had been downstairs since the morning, all of the lights were turned off and it was dark apart from a few lamps in the living room. When I got downstairs, I looked to see where the dog was barking, and it was out the window. My dog eventually stopped barking as much since I was there now, but just to make sure everything was fine, I looked out the window to see what the cause of his distress was. When I opened the curtains enough so that I could get a clear look out the window, I saw a car still running, sitting in the front of my garden. It took me a quick second in the dark to also notice that the front gate to my garden was open. My garden is surrounded by a low stone wall with a wooden fence on a latch. I then realized that a man that I had never seen before was standing just beyond the gate, surveying the house, looking through the upstairs windows, presumably for human activity. I stared in bewilderment at this person for what felt like a really long moment before he turned and looked into the window that I was staring out of. We locked eyes for about three seconds. He looked as shocked as I was. Moments later, he started running towards the car and, in my shock, I didn't know what to do but run upstairs and get my brother. By then, the dogs had made enough noise to wake my brother up, so I ran into his room and frantically yelled at him to come downstairs and look. But by the time that I managed to get him downstairs, the car had turned around and was just pulling away. The road outside my house leads to a dead end and it's really hard to turn around there. There isn't much space. It usually takes a minute to do so. But we saw the car speed off down the driveway and we just stood in shock for a while before either of us spoke. We decided that I should call our parents and tell them to come home and explain what happened. After around another hour or so, both my parents were home and neither of them actually believed me brushing it off as probably just someone lost and told me that there was no need to call the police so I kind of felt really dumb for a while but fast forward about three days and I was in school talking to my friends and I found out that on that exact night that this occurred there had been a string of serial robberies around the area and mainly isolated farmhouses were hit. Since then, I've started locking the front door, even in the daytime, and I have a bit of a panic attack every time my dogs start barking or I see a car coming towards the house. It was a frightening experience, and I'm glad that it turned out the way that it did, because it could have gone very differently. This happened when I was roughly three or four years old, I think. And me and my family had just moved into a new house after the rent on our old house got too high and my mum just couldn't pay it anymore. 
So one day, about a week or so after moving in, me and my mum were home alone. My older sisters were at school. My mum was in the kitchen making me lunch and doing the laundry when she heard me giggling and talking in my bedroom. She didn't think anything of it because it's fairly normal for kids to talk to themselves when playing with toys and all that sort of stuff. But when she brought me my lunch, she found me half laying under my bed, talking. She asked who I was talking to, and I emerged from under the bed and replied, I'm talking to my friend, Rose. Can't you see her? She's under my bed. Now, my mum doesn't believe in the paranormal or anything, but this gave her the creeps. She made me eat my lunch in the living room and told me to watch cartoons so that she could keep an eye on me. Fast forward a couple of days and my mum has a neighbour over for coffee and I'm sitting on the floor playing with my toys. Somehow the topic of Rose came up and my mum was telling the neighbour about it. And the neighbour started asking me questions about Rose, like what did she look like, what we spoke about, etc. So I answered, oh she's older than me, she's a teenager and she's got ginger hair and green eyes. She tells me about her mummy, her mummy was bad. My mum, for as long as she lives, will never forget the look on the neighbour's face. The neighbour then asked to talk to my mum privately, and it wasn't until recently that I found out what the neighbour had told her. It turns out that Rose wasn't just an imaginary friend, because she was the girl who had previously lived in this house. From what I've been told, Rose was a 16-year-old girl who lived in the house with her mum about 10 years before we moved in. Her mum was an abusive alcoholic, and from what I've heard, that's why Rose, or Rosemary, ended her life at the play park across the street. She was apparently just sick of her abusive mum. It all saddens me thinking of her, because as someone who's been close to this sort of stuff, as someone who's dealt with various forms of abuse, I do feel her pain. And I just wish that she had the support that I had when I was in that dark place. So after listening to uh, a bunch of these, I decided to share one of my own encounters. So I was, and still am, living in BC at the time. I was 17 and living with my mum, but working full time. I normally left the house at about 4am to walk to work for 4.30am. I started my walk like I did every other morning, got myself bundled up, it was during the winter, and put my headphones in and started my journey to work. I get a couple of houses down from my mum's place and a guy steps out onto the sidewalk. He shouts something out to me that I don't quite understand because I had my music in my ears so I pull out my earbud and ask him to repeat himself. He looks at me with this wide-eyed look and I immediately regretted asking him to repeat what he said. But he goes, Jesus loves you in a creepy kind of sing-song voice. I'm like, uh, thanks, I guess. And he's like, and Jesus wants me to take your life. At this point, my blood just ran cold. The street was empty besides us. I was trained in martial arts at the time, so I kind of shifted my stance, knowing full well that I would still get my ass kicked, but I didn't want to show fear. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the pepper spray that my mum had handed me earlier for when I walk around at such an early hour. I showed it to him and screamed with all that I could to leave me alone. I said to him, leave me alone right now, I'm going to call the police. He then says, Jesus loves you again. I don't really know how to share it in such a way that could truly match the tone of which he said it in, but it was creepy. He kind of half sung it, half said that in a, in a mocking tone and skipped, yes, skipped like a child who's excited about receiving a candy or a toy away from me. I walked down the road a bit further and called my parents on the house phone from my cell so the ringing would wake someone up. And when my dad answered, I practically shouted at him to meet me outside with my mum and to bring the phone out in case this freak decided to follow me home. Upon getting home, I called the police and they told me something similar had happened to a, a girl my age and she kept walking, but when she turned the corner, three other guys attacked her and almost killed her. But because it was so dark, I couldn't really make out the details about this guy. All I could really tell is that he was high or something. 
I stayed home for three days and refused to leave my house because it happened not more than three houses down from where I lived. The police couldn't really do anything as I didn't have a description and they weren't sure if the attackers and the taunting Jesus loves you guy were working together or if it was just crap luck for that girl. Either way, I sure hope that I never see that guy again. I used to live in an old wooden shack that my great-grandfather built. It was old, damp, and smelled funny. We would go there every summer with my cousins, and we would have the best time. My mother and I actually started living there full-time when my grandmother gave the house to her as a present as well. We lived there for about three years before we knocked it to build a new house as the shack was beginning to fall asunder. And while living there... I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night and see miniature silhouettes sitting on the top of my wardrobe, dangling or kicking their legs like a, a child in a chair almost. Sometimes they would sit on the end of my bed too, and they were perfectly proportional, but were smaller than most humans, I suppose. They never really caused any harm, just kind of frightened me, I suppose. In the foundations of our new house, my grandmother had placed a miraculous medal, a religious relic, in the cement. Now, just to be clear, I'm not a religious man in any way, shape, or form, but when we moved into this new house, there was no sign of the many shadows anymore. A few years later, we did some renovations to the house. We were staying in my grandmother's house while the work was being done, and the wall containing the metal was knocked in the process. I was the first to move back in, alone. I'd gone down before everyone else so I could pay my sister's room as a favor. On the first night after a long day of painting, I went into my room and got comfy watching YouTube videos. All the doors and the windows were closed, and I had a can of Lynx deodorant on my desk that I'd put there earlier in the day, and nowhere near the edge. When, I was rudely interrupted by the can being flung across the room and smashing off of the floor, almost as if something was welcoming me home, welcoming me back to the madness. A week later, the rest of my family moved in and everything was normal. One night, my sister started bawling crying in her room. My mother went to comfort her and she told her that she saw little people in her room dancing around, the same ones that had pestered me at her age. I still live there and I haven't seen them in years. I get reoccurring nightmares of an adult-sized one standing over me in my bed sometimes, sporting sharp teeth and sunken eyes. There's occasional voices and whispers in my room, and we've also caught a lot of what paranormal investigators refer to as orbs in this room. It's an ongoing issue for me in this house, and honestly, I just cannot explain it. I live in a really small house in the southern US, and I've lived here for about... Uh, five, no, uh, maybe six months. And my house is considered a, a mother-in-law house on my landlord's property, so it's really just a small downstairs and small upstairs. But it works well for me since I don't have many things. The little house itself has been on the landlord's property for about 80 years now. It was actually shipped here from out of state, and the owners at the time re-cemented it into the ground. I've never had any issue in the house or suspicious or unexplained things go on. However, I've never felt entirely comfortable on the second floor of the house either for some reason. Because I just regularly get the feeling that I'm being watched or that there's another presence in the room or something. It's not a feeling that I would previously get in other homes that I've lived in, but it's almost atmospheric if that's the right way to explain it. I find it uh, a little bit unsettling and can ignore it most of the time. But last night as I got into bed and pulled the blankets over me, I turned my head to the side to sleep and I swear to you that I felt pressure being applied to the blanket that was near my head. It only lasted about two seconds but it was gentle and I felt it move across a few inches down from my head. At first I assumed that it's my cat walking over to me so I turned to look for her and when I do, there's nothing there. In the moment, I just ignored it and I turned my lights off. It did cross my mind as I'm a little bit strange and I went on to wake up several times throughout the night though. This was somewhat normal for me though. 
I also noticed that my bathroom motion sensor light was turning on multiple times throughout the night when I was up, which I must admit did make me feel uneasy. And when I woke up for work this morning, it just kind of struck me that it almost felt like a, a finger slowly moving from my head to my neck. There's a part of me that sees all of this as just kind of happenstance, but I can't repress the, uh, the uncomfortable feeling I get upstairs any longer, and the little things happening last night weren't quite adding up. I'm also feeling even more uncomfortable about going up there to sleep tonight, so wish me luck, I guess. When I was around 10, I used to live with my mum when my parents were divorced in a house for people with low incomes. The primary floor is where you found the common places like the living room or the kitchen, and the second floor is only made of two bedrooms, a toilet, and the bathroom. But there's not much space on that second floor, so you can easily see or hear anything in the toilet or the bathroom from my bedroom. Well, at the time, I was sad about my parents getting divorced, so in order to help me sleep easily, my mother used to set a light on upstairs and a bit of music on a computer. And this really helped for maybe a year or so, until it happened. So one night, as usual, I was going to bed. I don't know how to describe it best, but it was one of those beds that had a, a bookshelf and a desk under it, so it was quite close to the ceiling. The music and the light were on and everything was fine until the music stopped. My mother was downstairs with a friend of hers so she couldn't hear that the music was off but it was okay. I wasn't afraid. This had happened a few times before. But then I started to hear like someone slowly walking close to the door of my bedroom which was almost closed in order to let some light in. The floor of this place is like plastic. It can make this like... Uh, little sticky noise when you walk on it with your bare feet and that was the sound that I heard. I could also hear my mum downstairs so I was sure that she wasn't the one walking around here and it continued for quite some time and then it started to make that sound in my bedroom right under my bed like someone was just walking in my room and under my bed. I began to be really scared so I tried to hide under my blankets I could move, but I couldn't scream or make a damn noise, and finally I started to feel little vibrations inside the bed, with the noise that something was taking the stare of my bed. At that moment, I turned my back. I didn't want to see it. All I could hear was the noise of the stairs and the feeling that something heavy was standing right by my side. It ended when I felt a sort of cold whoosh from the back of my head, strong enough to go under the blanket again. I screamed so loud that my mum thought that I had a heart attack or something. She took care of me all night and told me later, years later, that when she came into the bedroom, she felt really uncomfortable in there because the room was ice cold. Since then, I've had multiple experiences on the second floor of this house. I still live in it, actually. Some scary and others just really weird. And if you guys would like to hear more about this house, or if you have any questions, please let me know in the comment section below. I'm a female, 23 years old as of today, but this happened a couple of years ago. I was 19 at the time. So, before I tell this story, I guess you're going to need a little bit of context. At the time, I was in my second semester at university, so most of my classes were scheduled very early in the morning. Here in my country, there's not on-campus housing or anything like that, so I had to come and go from my house to uni and vice versa. As someone who happens to use a wheelchair, finding transport was extremely difficult for me. Having that in mind, meant that taking a taxi where I live isn't the safest option, I've always had one particular taxi driver who moves me wherever I needed to go. Every day he would come and pick me up for my classes, always on time, every day, except that morning. 6.45am and there were no signs of him. My first class was at 7am. I had to go or I wouldn't get there in time. Afraid that my grades would be affected by skipping that one class and also against my better judgement, I decided to take a regular cab which wasn't easy because not that many of them would stop after seeing the wheelchair. 
Not enough space, they said, and I would always sigh, waiting for the next one. But then one of them finally accepted to take me, and it must have been the fact that I was running late or how poor lit it was at the time, but I just gave him one glance before climbing in the car. He helped me to put my chair into the back seat before sitting in the driver's side of the car. That's when I could see him better, and yeah, he was a little ragged and a bit sketchy. His face was dirty and had multiple pimples and marks. But then again I thought, who am I to judge? It's just a 15 minute drive and I'm already inside. So I smiled and tried to be polite, keeping my eyes up front. He seemed to be chatty, asking all kinds of questions, to which I only answered short and simple, nodding and not wanting to be rude. After a while, I just stopped answering because it was getting a little bit weird. Instead, he started telling me about his life, how he'd separated from his wife because he found her with another man and how he wanted to kill them both. More specifically, all the ways of how he was going to kill them as well. I was feeling freaked out by the way that he was telling me those things. His voice was just so full of rage and his face turned so red. But the look on his face, I'll never forget it. Those were the eyes of a true madman. At this point, my hand was glued to the door handle. He just kept getting angrier and angrier and I wanted, actively considered even, to throw myself out of the car. Obviously, I couldn't though. He then said, in a quiet, lower voice, I've, uh, I've done some horrible things, miss. And I just tried to keep calm. For just a few more minutes, I thought. I don't remember much more of what he told me before we got to the parking lot of my uni. Except this. Miss, the devil is inside of me. Needless to say, it was a very scary ride. When he helped me out of the car, he also told me, be good or I could kill you someday. I didn't say anything, just paid him and then I rolled away. After five minutes, I could see him from the central hallway, still in the parking lot. He wouldn't leave and I had to do at least three laps in the main building until he was gone. I didn't want him to know where my classroom was and even after he left, I called a friend to escort me to the class just in case. In the end, too, I was, unfortunately, 30 minutes late for class. But I've never been that scared, and I hope I won't ever be again. So my father, Wayne, worked in a machine shop across town, which had its fair share of characters there. And one of these people was James. Now, James was one of those guys that would seem normal at first, but had one hell of a temper. But one minute, he'd be eating lunch, and the next, he'd be trying to fight you over the smallest things. Now, while my father was at work, James had come in absolutely drunk, which many other guys had done before, but James could barely function, let alone operate a mill. My father pulled him aside and told him that he needs to leave, that him coming in drunk could possibly get him or someone else hurt, which leads to him getting pissed and trying to fight my dad. James isn't a small guy too. He's six foot and on the larger side, while my father is only five six. James grabbed a metal pole too and was swinging it around trying to hit my dad. Thankfully, he didn't hit him, but tore the hell out of the door before being restrained by the other workers and was kicked out, being fired. My father ended up leaving work early that day and made his way to a friend and they had a beer and just calmed his nerves. Later on in the day, eight-year-old me was home alone as my mother was at the store getting groceries. I was playing Halo 3 at the time before hearing a knock at the door and I walked up to the door and see James through the window. Although I didn't know him well as I've only met him once, I knew him well enough to know that he wasn't a stranger so I opened the door. Hey, is your father home? He had said in the nicest tone that I guess he could muster, his breath smelling of alcohol. I said no, but somehow my eight-year-old self knew well enough to not say that I was home alone. My mum is in the shower, though. That was an absolute lie. Her truck wasn't even in the driveway, and it was obvious that I was home alone. He had nodded, though, walking away from the door a little before I closed it, promptly locking it before going back to my game. A few minutes pass and my mother arrives home with a few groceries. Once they were brought inside, we had heard a bang at the door, then another and another, and this was not like a knock, but more like someone was banging on our door trying to get in. 
my mother looked through the window before grabbing me and the phone and running into the bedroom closet, which had a lock. I had no clue what was going on, but I knew then that it wasn't good. She called 911 and said that there was a crazed man trying to break in. All the while, the sound of the banging could be heard in the background. For what seemed like hours, we waited in the closet, still hearing the loud bangs as he started charging into the door with his shoulder screaming like a maniac. After about 15 minutes, we heard the familiar sound of the police siren as we heard the confrontation outside. It didn't take long for them to arrest the man. My mother stayed on the line with the 911 operator until we finally walked out, seeing James in cuffs in the back of the patrol car. My father had rushed home and hugged us both, James staring at us with bloodlust in his eyes. And although it wasn't confirmed, I had a good feeling that he was just after my dad, wanting to finish the job in beating him and potentially killing him even. He had seen my mother's truck thinking that it was my father as he drove it into work every now and again. But in the end, it was a pretty narrow escape for my dad, I think. My house was brand new when we bought it. No one has ever lived here before us and we live in a very small and quiet one street subdivision outside city limits. So, to our knowledge, there has never been a house on this property before. When we were signing the paperwork, there was a statement that we had to sign that said that it had never been on Indian burial grounds. I thought that that was kind of weird, but it's probably something that they put on all house paperwork nowadays. We're a military family and my husband sometimes has to be gone for days and months at a time. During the first years of our marriage, I was also in the military. I deployed a couple of times and he went on 10-day trips overseas every month at least. And We've been a part of a lot. I'm definitely used to it by now. But besides double-checking the doors and windows before I go to bed at night, I have pretty much no problem being alone, not counting kids. About a year after we moved in, in 2014, when my son was four, my husband had to leave. I don't remember now if he was deployed or was just going to be out in the field for a week or so, but whatever the reason, he was gone. A few nights after he'd been gone, everything was going on as usual. I went through the bedtime routine with my son, giving him a bath and getting him in his PJs, read him a bedtime story and tucked him in with his poo bear that he had since he was a baby. He's always slept with Pooh and hardly went anywhere without him. I checked all the doors and the windows as usual, then tried to decide if I wanted to spend all of my precious kid-free couple of hours before bed, reading or take a shower, and lose some of that time. I decided on the shower, and when I got out, I dried off and wrapped up in a towel. I walked into my bedroom to get dressed, and I had just reached the side of my bed where my dresser was. Some lights were still on in the house, including the living room, but it was quiet. Quiet enough that I heard little footsteps coming down the hallway toward the living room. Across the room, opposite to where I was standing, was my bedroom door. It was wide open and I could see into the living room. The footsteps continued and when they reached the living room, I wasn't surprised to see it was my son. He was the only one in the house besides me after all. He was in his PJs and holding his poo bear in his arms like he usually did. I thought that maybe he'd had a bad dream and was coming to me for comfort. But about the same time that this thought crossed my mind, instead of coming toward my bedroom door, he just turned and walked calmly and slowly through the living room toward the kitchen. There were lights still on in the kitchen, so I figured he probably thought that I was in there. I called his name and hurried out of the room and he didn't answer. I called him again and looked around the living room before going into the kitchen. Both rooms were empty and he didn't answer when I called his name. And that was really unlike him. I checked the only other room in the end of the house, the laundry room, but he wasn't there. Perplexed and left scratching my head, I turned and began checking the other end of the house, even though there was no way that he could have gotten past me without me seeing him. I finally checked his room and he was laying in his bed with his poo bear, sound asleep. Now, with the way my house is set up, there's just no way that he could have gotten into his room without me seeing him. That is, unless he crawled on the ceiling above me or something. Furthermore, at the age of four, he would never go back to his bed on his own after getting up at night. Any time that he got up, we would always have to walk him down to his room and tuck him back in. Unless he had a bad dream or was scared or something, in which case he would end up sleeping in our bed. 
His room is at the end of the hallway, and even though we had put nightlights in every socket, he was always scared to walk down there by himself after dark, even if the lights were on in the hallway too. If we didn't go down there with him, he wouldn't even step foot into that hallway. And this continued until he got a few years older too. I've told this story to a few people and the rational debunking explanations are always I'd been dreaming or my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I had just gotten out of the shower so I was completely awake. If I had only gotten a brief glimpse out of the corner of my eye, I could agree that it was my eyes playing tricks on me. But because I had heard those footsteps first, I was looking straight out into the room when I saw him walk by. I mean, it wasn't just a brief glimpse. I saw him for a good few seconds. This incident didn't really scare me at all. I was more confused than anything, if I'm being honest. I had seen my son walk by, but then found out that he'd been asleep the whole time. I thought for a while that I must have just been losing my mind, but nothing even remotely similar has happened in the five years since then. I still don't know what I saw that night, but I'm convinced that it wasn't my son. So this was two years ago when I was 14. I lived in a rural country area where it's normal to walk pretty much everywhere, whether it's the shops or park or school, and on occasion I was going to the shops because I'd earned some pocket money that week and decided to use some of it on junk food. After grabbing what I wanted and leaving the store, I was walking past some of the houses, one of which had a man out front. He was kind of fat, had unkempt facial hair, and a really dirty shirt. Anyone would find it suspicious, but I just ignored him and didn't bother changing my path because seeing hobos in my town was the usual. But he was staring at me the whole time it took for me to close the distance between us while passing him. And it was abrupt when he grabbed my wrist. I turned around trying to pull my hand back, but being the small person I was, I couldn't get out of his grip. And that was when he started dragging me towards his house. Now, a little extra info, his house had a lockable gate around it. He successfully dragged me past that gate and shut it without even caring about the loud bang. I was of course struggling and kicking around before stepping on his foot. He wore Crocs, which finally got him to let go of me. I tried to open the gate, only realizing that it had a combination lock. At this point, he was swearing at me and trying to grab me again, and I did my best to kick him away before just attempting to jump over the gate. It was roughly up to my stomach height and I didn't exactly land gracefully, grazing a few body parts, but I got over. Once I mustered up enough energy to get up and start running again, I didn't stop until I got home. I did check to see if he was following me, but no, he wasn't, thankfully. You might be wondering what happened to the shopping. Well, I ditched it after he started dragging me. And what happened to him? Is he in jail? I did eventually get an interview with the police and what they said terrified me. The man had raped children younger than me and killed them. And chances are if I didn't report it, more people would have suffered. But yes, he's now in jail. I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies and a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles a day, often in the neighborhood. But nearly as often, I load us up in the van and drive ten minutes to the wooded metro park. I really love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some bicycles and skis, some just people, and last year they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of our town, but in the dark with no leaves on the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths, concrete fire pits, rangers patrolling regularly, and the hospital behind CVS means that there's emergency medical care and walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part, so we're walking, not yet jogging again, but after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. 
Then my youngest had an appointment, and then I had to run a few errands, and then we had unexpected visitors right after school, and then they stayed for dinner, and finally I got the dogs into the van, and we made it to the park just before it started to get dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day, but as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized that we'd be walking the sunset, watching it over the lake and the hills and through the bare trees. The park was clearing out now as it started towards dark. We would very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. There is an amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs that hike the pet path. Anyway, all those little irritations had led to this singular moment of beauty I would not otherwise have seen and appreciated. And this was going to be a really good walk. It's funny how life works out when you kind of let it. So, I parked in my spot at the farthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile-long, people or walkers or joggers only, path looped through the woods and by the lake and came out by the bathrooms. I actually liked to run it when I came here alone. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods. My feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky... I absolutely loved it. About halfway now and the city sounds had faded away until I could only hear the birds and the frogs. Insects too, all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. But then, a crack. And then, utter silence and absolute stillness. My dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come to the crest of a hill... I couldn't see anything and heard only the dogs panting, so I waited for the nature sounds to return, but they didn't. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, the first standing on end all around their shoulders and necks, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me down the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put their ears back and heads down and began to pull me. So, off we went. But the woods were still dead silent. I thought to myself, we must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill, not seen him, and after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree, and his hoof hit a dead branch, and the branch broke, and that was what the crack sound was and why everyone was scared. But why were the woods still silent? Maybe there's someone up there. I mean, homeless people must stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have the heat, so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's just setting up a shelter and the crack was just a broken branch. But again, why are the woods still silent? We were about as far from the city as you could get in these woods and you couldn't see the CVS sign or the glow from the streetlights or even hear the traffic noises. It was dark and still and absolutely quiet except for the panting of dogs and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run too. I kept thinking to myself, is it a Bigfoot? That must have been a Bigfoot breaking a log to say get out. But there are no Bigfoot in city limits. I promise you that. It must have been a deer, and the woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog here. Yes, they're the big huskies, and another 200 pounds on me. Yeah, I'm a little overweight, but I've got a bit of muscle underneath it. I have broad shoulders and big hands, and we are the scariest thing in these woods. There's no bears, no wolves, no Bigfoot. There are deer and there are foxes, and there might be an angry raccoon, but... But we're the biggest and baddest, scariest thing in these woods. That is, unless there's someone with a gun. <sighs> That's not helping. I need to stop thinking this way. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. And they just wanted to go. We'd gone almost a mile now. Me craning my head the whole time. Trying to see as far as I could in all directions while letting the dogs pull me down the path and... It was still absolutely silent. There was not an overflying goose, not a cricket. Nothing moved and nothing made a sound. Except us, of course. Here came the third and the longest of the three steep hills on this trail. I'd been running these to rebuild my strength and endurance. 
but if I ran at this point, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested, you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where, if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait, unseen, for someone to come up the path. Was it a deer, or was it an ambush? Should I turn around? No, it was just a deer. But what if it's behind us? What if it is an ambush? Or what if it is someone with a gun? What if it's Bigfoot? It has to have been a deer. And this is why I end up running. The noise in my head is just unbearable otherwise. Up the hill, walk, pay attention, watch the dogs. The dogs were still on alert but didn't hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. I kept saying to myself, just walk, don't get smoked, be able to run or fight if you have to. Yeah, okay, I'm scared, the woods should still not be this silent, the dogs should not still be on alert, and it's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's a Bigfoot, but it could definitely be a person. So, let's be smart, just walk, we're not good prey, the dogs will protect me, the huskies might not, alone, but the shepherd will, and they'll follow his lead, be smart and get out. It's only another mile now to the lake in the first parking lot, then another half mile along the lake to the second lot where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets and no frogs. And the smell almost stopped me dead in my tracks. But the dogs just kept pulling. It was sour and grassy and oddly metallic and fecal. There was crap and blood and partially digested grass maybe. I smelled the contents of a deer stomach I think which meant that someone had hunted these woods and the dogs were not at all interested in the smell and so we ran again. I don't remember much of that last mile but we just ran. Desna, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. Then she began to sniff and pee. The boys followed her lead. There was a single truck parked and I relaxed quite a bit but still felt a bit on edge. Down the lake in the next parking lot I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake. Their headlights illuminated the lakeside path and that's when I realized that they were watching us. Halfway to the van now and the car drove away. 20 feet from the van and I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I just knew it with an absolute certainty. Finally though, the dogs were in and I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt, starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas and as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebars. Was it a gun? A deer carcass? I couldn't tell and because of the angle when pulling away, I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror. But I was pretty sure that it was a gun. And so, I guess the question is, were we the ones being hunted? So this is my first time sharing this story and I have a question. Am I being followed by something? Let me elaborate. For the past two nights, strange noises and occurrences have been happening around me, always at 2.30, but at two separate locations, which is why I believe that I'm being followed by something. I'm a strong believer in the paranormal, and have had experiences in the past, but this just feels different. Anyway, I'll just get to the experiences. So, the first incident happened on Tuesday night, April 2nd, at around 2.30, I was on a 24-hour CQ shift, standing guard at a barracks to make sure people don't mess around too much. It was all quiet until this point that I started hearing whistling in the hallways. Now, 
The desk I sit at has view of both wings of the barracks and I can see straight down each of them without much effort. And I see no one, so I begin to walk the halls and see if it's someone whistling loudly in their rooms or something. I pinpoint the whistling, but it's coming from a locked room. I believe it's a janitor closet or something. I thought it was just my mind playing games, so I went back to my desk. As I went back, I passed by the day room and witnessed the door to the day room closed when it had been propped open by a dumbbell. I started freaking out a bit over this and I went to the door to reopen it. When I got to the door, I looked into the day room and I see the little soccer dudes on the football table spin, as if someone ran up to spin them and vanished. I'm extremely freaked out now and head back to my desk to gather my thoughts when I heard the sound of doors being slammed in both halls, except none of the doors were opening or looked to have been closing. And after that, nothing. Just one wild-eyed me sitting at my desk till 9am. So that was the first incident, but the second one happened last night at my girlfriend's place. I was staying the night and had went to bed early so that I could be at work at 600 for PT. I'm usually a deep sleeper, but for some reason I woke up at around 2.30 again this morning to the sound of light knocking at the bedroom door. She has a nightlight out in the hall and I could see something or someone blocking the light as if a person was in front of the door, and after a few seconds, the figure moved out from the doorframe, and I heard footsteps going down the stairs. Well, again, trying to remain calmish, I thought I'd been a dumbass and left the door unlocked, and maybe someone was sneaking about. So I grab her bat that she keeps under her bed to go check if someone had broken in. I walk downstairs and check all the locks and the windows, and they're definitely all locked. I start freaking out again and was about to head back upstairs when I heard a soft whisper of my girlfriend's name. I stand on edge and then hear what sounds like long scratching on the basement door which is underneath her staircase I think. At this point I nope the heck out of there and head back upstairs where I remained awake until I had to leave to go to PT. Now, I'm sitting here confused and a little on edge as I believe something has attached itself and it is potentially following me. To add more reasons to why I think that it could be paranormal too. The night before it happened, a buddy of mine in the same building used a Ouija board and I have a feeling that he didn't close it properly and maybe it attached itself to me. So, I'll ask the same question to you guys. Am I being followed or is it just a spooky coincidence? Other than that, I have no other theory to go off of, so if anyone has any theories or suggestions on what I might be able to do, then please do help. This is a story that happened to me when I was a child, and I thought I'd share it on here. I've never shared it with anyone really before, so here goes nothing. So this took place back around 2008 if my memory serves me right. Me and my family had just moved to Costa Rica and we enjoyed spending most of our time at the beach. But one beach in particular which was near a lovely little river that I like to swim in. And it was on this same beach that 9 year old me found a dead body floating in the ocean. To give a little context, I'd been playing on the beach which we thought was a relatively safe beach so my parents were farther up. How wrong we were about it being safe though. I remember seeing something floating in the water, but I wasn't sure what it was, so I went to investigate and found a dead man just floating there. Part of his leg had been hacked off. It was obvious that he had not drowned. The man had clearly been murdered. Around this time, we had heard about a recent string of murders that had happened both on the Caribbean side of Costa Rica, where we were, and on the Pacific side. The murders had been happening every six months, rotating in between both regions of the country, so, there was reason to assume that this murder had been done by the same person since it seemed to fit the timeline. As far as I can remember, the details of the murder were never disclosed in any of the local newspapers, only that the man had been a tourist from England. So, there was no way for anyone who had not seen the man on the beach to know the specifics of his murder. Eventually, the whole thing blew over and we returned to that same beach. I can't quite remember a time frame, but it was definitely within a few months of me finding the dead man that this next part happened. 
One day, I was swimming in the river with my mother when a very strange man popped up out of the water, startling us. He had a spear gun in hand and snorkel mask on, and anyways, he began talking to my mum, and I think we could both tell that something was just off about this guy. I wasn't really paying attention for most of this conversation, but I do remember him bringing up the recent murder on the beach, and he seemed to know a great lot of details about it too, which, as I previously mentioned, were not available to the public. It almost seemed as if he was trying to confess that he was the one who murdered this man, but without directly saying so. He also talked about how he travelled in between the Caribbean and the Pacific side of Costa Rica, spending half a year in each spot. Eventually, they also got onto the topic of what he did for a living, and he went into great detail about how he made the masks for the movie Eyes Wide Shut, and that he would make those masks and I presume other ones based on real life human emotions and that he specifically liked capturing the look of fear. We were totally taken aback by this guy and honestly didn't really know what to do. Eventually we just got back into the river and swam away and thankfully we never saw him again. I do not know if this is related or not but the weird strain of murders suddenly stopped after that too. So I have three kids, one biological, and two of them were recently adopted in April. One of the adopted kids is a girl, so I have a daughter now, but when these incidents occurred, it was before we were matched with them, so I only had my son with me. This is relevant. The first incident occurred at a restaurant. I live in a small but rapidly growing town, and we'd been out to eat at a brand new restaurant and were on our way out. My husband had already gone out to the car, but I had stayed inside to take my son to the bathroom. He was six at the time. So, as we were leaving, trying to get past a crowd at the door, an old man stopped me and asked, Do you have a daughter? Thinking that he'd simply mistaken me for someone else that had a daughter, I told him no and tried to keep walking. But he continued to speak and I politely stopped to listen. He said, I have a daughter, she's the prettiest, sweetest thing you ever saw, but what I always wanted was a son just like your boy here. I would give you my daughter if you would let me have your son. She's the prettiest little girl that you'll ever see. Alarm bells instantly went off. I kind of nervously laughed like it was a joke and said no, then made a beeline out of there, squeezing my son's hand tight. He hadn't heard what the man said yet. The guy was a complete stranger. I had never seen him before and I was walking past him when he stopped me to ask me to trade my son. I tried to write it off as just a, a weird random encounter and forget about it. But a few months later, I was at the Walmart with my son, just me and him. At this time, we had just been matched with our other two kids but were waiting on a new license so we hadn't even been allowed to meet them yet. We knew their ages and that one was a boy and one was a girl but not much else. We had picked up something small that day, so as we were walking toward the door to leave, I had the bag in one hand and was holding my son's hand in the other. He had recently turned seven, and as we passed by a customer service desk, a disheveled looking man in dirty overalls reached towards us and stopped us. At first, I thought he was just a homeless man and going to ask for money, but when he asked if I had a daughter, I realized that it was the same man from the restaurant a few months earlier. He went through the entire spiel again about his pretty little daughter and wanting to trade for my son. When he finished his speech, I told him no, obviously, and that we were adopting a girl. And then we just walked away from him. To be honest with you, I don't know why I told him about adopting. I'm not too good in social situations, and it just kind of popped out. He stared at us with a slightly surprised look, before calling out, You're a better person than me. We ignored him and just hightailed it out of there. A few moments later, my son, who had been quiet this whole time, said, You wouldn't trade me for anything, would you? And I assured him that I never would. I made a post about the encounter on Facebook too. Shortly after that too, one of my friends directed me to a conversation in one of our town pages where other women were talking about an old, dirty, disheveled man in overalls telling them about his pretty daughter and wanting to trade for their sons. I can't really remember what he was wearing at the restaurant, but I think that he had been dressed up a little nicer then. 
Now, I could understand striking up a conversation with a stranger and, in the course of it, maybe joking about trading kits. It's still not entirely appropriate, I know, but understandable, right? But this guy, he seeks out women with young boys, who he has no business with, and asks to trade. One woman said that the guy actually followed her out of the store and kept talking about his beautiful daughter. I think he was kicked out of a few stores in town because he wouldn't stop doing this after employees told him to quit. He could just be a harmless old man with a twisted sense of humour and poor social skills, or he could have mental problems, I suppose. Or maybe he has bad intentions. Though, I don't know anyone who would agree to trade children with anyone, much less a creepy old stranger. Oh, and uh, for the record too, no one has ever seen this beautiful daughter that he keeps talking about. So I guess my question for you guys is... Which of these do you guys think that is more likely? About 10 years ago, I was between 19 and 21. I was living in an apartment with who would eventually be my wife and our cat. It was around 4 or 5 p.m. She was getting ready for work when I heard a voice. It wasn't scary, but it was definitely not human or nice. It started saying stuff like, I'm going to get you. Oh man, I'm so going to get you. It was excited that it was going to get me, whatever that entailed. Obviously, I was terrified. I was a 20-year-old man curled up in the corner of our bed against the wall covered in blankets. I told my wife and she pretty well ignored me. What was she going to do anyway? She didn't hear anything and she had to go to work. I feel like this went on for about 10 minutes at most, long enough for my wife to finish getting ready for work and leave. I was alone, but all I could do was wait. Suddenly, our cat comes tearing into the bedroom, leaps onto the bed, swipes about a foot and a half in front of me, then leaps off the bed and runs. The voice is gone and I'm alone, but was I just hearing the cat or did the cat just protect me? There was only me and my wife and the cat obviously in the building at the time and it was an old house turned into five apartments. We lived on the second floor and our bedroom was connected to two outside walls and the rest of our house. I talked to my wife about it too but she's of the mind that there's no point thinking about something if nothing can be done about it so all I got from her was confirmation that I heard something say that it was going to get me. I've had other experiences too but Nothing like this. So I'd just moved to a new city and had a few friends, but still wanted to meet some new people and maybe a cute girl to date. I began using Tinder, which I had fun with in other cities. I matched with this gorgeous woman, way out of my league, and her profile was funny and interesting. We get to chatting and she's flirtatious and clever and let it drop that she went to a top artsy school in France. So, obviously, I'm pretty intrigued and also thinking that she's out of my league. Why is she so interested? So, I decided to Google her, which is not something I used to do before every date. Usually, this will bring up a Facebook, an Instagram, LinkedIn account, etc. But when I clicked enter... Her name came back with like 125,000 hits, news articles, videos, everything. And chronologically, the weirdness begins like this. As a teenager, she was one of those women who would start up correspondence with serial killers and had actually been engaged to two of them on death row before they were put to death. Next, she was engaged to her 6th grade English teacher in her early 20s. He was famous for having falsely claimed to kill Jean John Bennett Ramsey. For this, she was on Good Morning America saying he was going to use her to recruit 6th grade girls for a sex cult. Lastly, she became a high-end escort in the city and had a fairly popular blog about it too. I'm not shaming the sex worker community here, but still, it was like sprinkles on the weirdness of this whole thing. After seeing these things, I was intrigued and kind of creeped out by her and found out that she was the adopted daughter of a local billionaire. And I decided at this point that this just wasn't worth it and deleted Tinder the day before our date. The next day, she messaged me on another dating app asking me if I was still going to meet her for a drink. And it was a big fat no from me. So 
So a little bit of background. Growing up, I used to go with my mum to work sometimes because, well, she occasionally couldn't find a babysitter. I usually liked it though because it was fun to walk around the store and help with little things here and there. Though, that being said, it wasn't a very bad part of town in a not-so-good city, so I grew up around transients and homeless people. I think in hindsight, though, it was probably a good thing because it let me see that they were just normal people in bad times. But that also gave me a bit of a, a sixth sense for people since robberies have happened while I was actually in the store before. My mum always kept me cooped up in a little office in the back, so I was never in danger. Now, one day, my mum had to go into the store to pick up some check stubs, so I came with her. There was usually this homeless guy named Randy out front, and he never caused problems, and the whole store knew him, so they let him sit there to rest on rainy days like it was on that particular day. We walk inside, and my mum tells me to go by the registers and wait for a little bit. So I start leaning on things and playing with buttons of a broken cash register right next to the exit. I should also say too that today was an especially dead day at the store so there was only one check stand open at the other end of the line of the cash register. As I'm pushing the buttons I feel a tug on my shirt like someone is behind me. I assume it was my mum and turn around only to see that it was a middle aged couple that had deep wrinkles. The man smiles at me and says, Hi, we were wondering if you want to buy a puppy. We have a few in our car that we can show you. One if you want to see one in the car right now. I immediately get really bad vibes from these people. My mum always told me about people like this growing up, so I was already pretty scared from that. I tried to get past them and say something about needing to tell my mum and ask if I can get a puppy. As I'm walking around them, the man grabs my arm tight and starts to drag me to the door. I immediately grab on the edge of the register and hang on for dear life while calling for my mum. The man didn't look strong, but compared to the strength of a kid, it felt like fighting against a bear. Eventually, of course, he pried me off the thing, and I was ready to turn around to fight tooth and nail if need be. I was going to make sure that we made noise. But as I turned around, Randy was right there looking at us and asked if everything was okay. The woman this time came in and in a hurried tone said, Oh yes, he's our son. Come on, Greg. I scream, my name is Carlos. And just then, my mum started coming down and saw the guy holding and rushed over, separating us and said in a deadly serious tone, Can I ask why you're holding my son? The couple seemed to stop for a moment and think and then the woman said, Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I thought that that was our son. We better go look for ours. And rushed past Randy at the door. I told my mum what happened when they left and she thanked Randy profusely afterwards and held my hand every time that we went to the store afterwards. So this takes place at the rather infamous Myrtle's Plantation. Now, I know that with places that are kind of touristy as far as paranormal things go... They can be kind of questionable as far as the validity of what happens there. And this being such, I always tend to err on the side of caution as far as what I believe. And I always do a fairly thorough check of wherever I'm staying for any artificial motors and wireless speakers. Basically anything that can cause things to happen that may seem paranormal. And the cabin that we stayed in came up clear. So, we arrived at the plantation at around 2pm and we were given a complimentary tour of the grounds. I got vibes just all over the place too. It was pretty insane already because I get vibes but rarely do I get vibes that strong. We were then shown the place that we'd be staying that night and we were let in and essentially set free. I did my evaluation on the room and then afterward I noticed something. Near the back door of the room I got an insane vibe. Like, even stronger than the rest of the grounds. I just knew that something had happened there. I knew that I had to find out what happened. And this comes back up again later. By this point, it was probably around 5pm and understandably, we were pretty hungry. We left the plantation to go into town to get some food. We got back around 6.30pm and began to walk over to our cabin when a friendly woman that we'd seen earlier came over, knowing that we were paranormal enthusiasts and asked if we wanted to see a room which was in the actual plantation house. 
we were staying in a slave cabin. Now obviously, we said of course, and she brought us up to a room. We looked around, and it was pretty regular as far as vibes go, but when I went into the bathroom, I felt the most oppressive and just awful atmosphere. It was creepy and terrible, and I hated it, and instantly wanted to leave. I didn't necessarily think something had happened there, but I knew that something inhabited that bathroom and I knew that it wasn't something kind. But we didn't stay in that place for long, but it was cool to look at, I must admit. We left after probably 10 to 20 minutes, I'd say, of looking around and we went back to our cabin and got settled in for the night. My sister and I, we were somewhat younger at the time, slept in the same bed because, well, we were scared. She and I stayed up pretty late playing a game called Farkle. It's pretty fun and really good for a time killer. And as soon as midnight rolled around, we decided it would probably be best to put away the game and just go to bed. But as soon as we had put the game away and the noise of the game and our voices were gone, I noticed a, a noise. The rocking chair on the front of the porch of the cabin was rocking methodically back and forth. And the rocking I heard was hard enough back and forth that I was certain that it wasn't any wind responsible for it. I must admit that I got a little bit freaked out by that, but I decided I wasn't going to mention it to my younger sister as it would probably just trouble her. So she and I laid down to sleep. She fell asleep pretty quickly, but I was having issues falling asleep with all the thoughts and the worries running through my head. But all of those seemed quickly rather irrelevant as I heard footsteps on the stones outside of the cabin. Now, our cabin was fenced in and so it couldn't be entered by anyone who didn't have the key. But regardless, I heard the footsteps. And they continued as I heard light slaps of feet in the wooden porch along with a groan of the weight. And they continued on forward and the noise continued right on through the door. As I heard the figure pass right by my bed but didn't see anything, and then continue at the back door. I also smelled some sort of rosy scent. Obviously, I really had a hard time falling to sleep after that. This event happened around 1 in the morning, and I didn't fall asleep until around 3.30. When we woke up, we went into the main house for breakfast, and we heard a noise from the other campers about their experiences, which were equally terrifying including people who felt a presence sit down on their bed in the middle of the night, and a person coming out of a cabin to tell people to be quiet, but the cabin was actually void of people. We ate and shared our stories and then returned to our cabin. We sat there for a while playing games on our tablets and just relaxing, as it was a pretty nice cabin despite it being haunted. Then, I can't remember why, but my sister and my mum got into an argument the argument obviously didn't sit well with whatever was in that cabin because their argument was cut short by the faucet in the bathroom turning on full force and then turning back off again. And at this point, the three of us freaked pretty bad and we cleared out of the cabin in no less than 30 seconds. That was how that ended and I'm never going to forget how scary it was to be awake by myself in a cabin in the middle of nowhere and suddenly realize you're not alone. I moved around a lot when I was younger and some houses were just sort of naturally creepy while others were just mundane. I always choked it up to the openness of floor plans and the availability of natural light. Basements, for instance, are just kind of creepy, you know? I never worried too much about it though because whenever the house we were living in that year had a basement, it was generally finished and felt more like a slightly darker ground floor than a proper basement. Ironically enough, too, the creepiest house that I ever lived in had an amazingly open floor plan and ample natural light. So in the late 2010s, my family moved to Georgia. It was a small halfway suburb and halfway country town to the east of Atlanta. It's where road Atlanta is if there are any motorsports fans here. We found a big late 90s house for pretty cheap because the housing market was still pretty bad three levels, huge bedrooms, all of their own bathrooms, hardwood, finished basement, all of the McMansion fixings. We were told that for once that we'd be living there for a while too. My older sister and I were just about to start high school and my dad didn't want to move us around during that time of our lives. 
The house was built on a slight hill, so the basement was the ground floor on one side and underground on the other. On one end of the basement, there was a large bedroom with a door leading outside. This was my bedroom. Directly across from the door into the house was a room, probably 25 feet by 12 feet, I'd say, with no windows or interesting features, which we decided to use just as storage. This room had no door, just an opening to the rest of the fairly open basement. Towards the stairs, which more or less marked the midpoint of the basement, and off to the left was a series of three rooms. The central room, which connected to the rest of the basement via a regular door, was small, but it was finished. The other two, however, they weren't finished. One was your standard stud and slab basement room where the fuse box, the water heater, etc. were. The other had thick concrete walls and a ceiling made from corrugated steel laid across a few steel beams. I always figured it was just a tornado shelter or something. Past the stairs where a bar that was never used, not once in the years that we lived there, was a similarly disused home theatre and a game room. These three won't really be relevant, because most of the story takes place between my bedroom and the stairs. So, it took me a while to realise that the uneasy feeling I had in the house wasn't because I didn't really want to move back east. We had spent the last 18 months in the foothills of the Nevadas and it was quite fun. I had more or less grown up in the southeast and wasn't super thrilled to be there again. Everything was quiet for the first year or so that we lived there too, but... Then I started to get more comfortable spending time alone at night in the living room that we had set up down in the basement, playing Xbox or doing whatever else a 13-year-old boy with nothing to do does at night. But I started noticing sounds of shifting just every now and then. Maybe once every couple of months or so, I'd hear a noise from behind me in the big storage closet, which sounded like something rubbing against a box or possibly moving a lightly filled box across the carpet. Sometimes, it'd be a slight knock or a creak like a door hinge. I never thought too hard on it because what could it have been? Something actually in there or the mind of a 13-year-old looking for sounds to hear? I mean, houses make noise, I thought. It went on like that for a while too until one night, I had my dog down there with me and she perked up at the noise. And I realised then that it couldn't have been my imagination unless I had a telepathic link with my dog or something. It obviously wasn't that though, so I went into the storage room to have a look, but I didn't find anything amiss. Time went on and sounds happened every now and again with varying frequency, but then I started to hear the stairs creak at night. Never the whole flight, and not very frequently, but it was pretty clear. The bottom few steps were not carpeted, but the rest were, so you could tell the directionality of someone using them based on whether the sound went from wood to carpet or carpet to wood. And there was the clear but quiet sound of wood to carpet every now and then. Sometimes it was at night and sometimes in the middle of the day. But what's more too is that I wasn't the only one who heard it. My mum would ask why I was sneaking upstairs in the middle of the night when I never really had any reason to. And obviously I never did. Now one day I was upstairs home alone on a Saturday and clearly heard what I could have sworn was my younger brother who was definitely not home with me, call out, mum, from somewhere in the basement. It was slightly muffled, but definitely from inside the house. And that was the first time that I'd heard something that I couldn't just explain as the house shifting. Over the years we lived there, I heard my mum and my dog's name called out a few more times, and always from downstairs. Sometime after this, the dog started to get locked in weird places around the house when we left too. Sometimes it was in the laundry room where her food and water dishes were and sometimes in a bathroom upstairs, but once in the movie room, which we generally kept closed to prevent her from going in and laying down on the recliners in there, and once in the finished room between the tornado shelter and the utility closet. But she wasn't just closed in, the door had a lock and it was locked. These were push locks too, not toggle locks like most houses have. If you lock the door while it's open and then close it, it will unlock itself. But these doors were locked and needed to be opened with a key or screwdriver. And last time I checked, pugs can't really reach doorknobs. At first we thought that it was my youngest brother, but he was with us every time and couldn't have locked the doors from the outside. 
So now I'm hearing stuff shifting, names being called, the stairs sounding like someone's walking partway up them, and my dog is getting locked in odd rooms while we're all out. This was probably around the fourth year that we lived in that house. I was getting pretty tired of living in that basement. Fortunately though, when my sister moved off to college, I was allowed to take her old room on the top floor. A little while after changing rooms, my family all went on a week-long vacation without me. I had a job, a car to use, and I'm not that big on beaches, especially not those in Georgia, so I was fine to have a staycation away from my family. However, again at night, I heard a new sound, soft footsteps from the top of the basement stairs to the doorway of the master bedroom. The first two nights this happened, and they happened every night after the second night my family was away, I grabbed my gun and a flashlight and checked it out, making sure all the windows and the doors were locked. We didn't have a security system, so it was entirely possible for a door to be opened on the other end of the house, completely unbeknownst to me. Remember, too, that there were exterior doors in the basement. However, everything was locked up tight. The second to last night, though, at the end of the footsteps path, I heard a door close. I didn't go to check that one out, though, and I also didn't tell my parents about that. It was a year later, too, that I was moving out to college, so my family decided that they would finally answer my dad's employer's constant demands for relocation, and the house was being cleaned up to show and sell. They moved out into an extended stay, on my dad's company's dime, so as not to disturb the realtor's careful placement of furniture and whatnot. They got a few notices, though, from the realtor that physical, slightly dirty footprints were showing up on bath mats, like someone who wasn't exactly clean was stepping out of the shower. They put up a nanny cam too to see if someone was sneaking in, but they didn't find anything. After a while though, shower curtains were being torn down. During this period, there was a lot of stuff stored in the basement and I had need for an old dog kennel since I had adopted a dog of my own to keep me company at college. So I came over on a day that there were no showings and went into the storage room and grabbed it. And on the way back up the stairs... I heard a door open somewhere behind me, and that was the last time that I ever entered that house. My mum says that on the day that they were moving everything out, she and my dad were going room to room checking to see if anything had been left behind, but they were just leaving through the foyer and my mum to this day will swear that she heard someone laugh in the basement. She said that it sounded like me. My dad says that he didn't hear anything and... That was pretty much that. To be honest with you guys, I really don't know what to think. I've never been too certain on the possibility of the paranormal, but I've never been too closed off to it either. There are too many weird things that happened in that house and have never happened since for me to say that it was just a trick of my mind. But what could really be going on with a house that young? Are haunts known to progress slowly like that? But we lived there for almost six years and this is all there is to say. No huge weird event, just a series of really creepy noises and really strange events. Like I said, I, I really don't know what to think about it, but maybe you guys have some ideas as to what the deal was with that house. So I've had a handful of paranormal encounters. Now that I'm older, they have really stopped, and this happened when I was around 21, 22. I'm 30 now. So I rented a room in a two-story house at my friend's house in the second story. I had a female boxer dog that would sleep with me in the room, too. I had one window that would face the neighborhood street. One night, my dog jumped on my bed, blocking my view from my TV. I tried to move her with my feet, but she wouldn't budge. She kept a low growl facing my window... And since she didn't want to move, I turned off my TV and I just went to sleep. But she just kept growling. I don't know what time it was later, but I woke up to a very, very bright light shooting through my blinds. I instantly became annoyed and got up to see which car had the headlights on so bright that it was coming into my bedroom. Mind you, I'd never experienced this level of brightness before. So I got up and I put my fingers through the blinds to open them up. And then after that, everything just went blank. Now, I remember opening my eyes and walking inside a type of room of some sort. 
The room was metallic with no seams, just perfectly curved metal. In front of me was a perfectly metallic bed. It was just a metal rectangle in a grey colour. And behind me I could sense that there were things guiding me to this metal bed. We were communicating, but not through speaking. We were kind of talking through our minds or something, and I could tell that they were just trying to guide me to the metallic bed in the middle of the room. I remember standing right in front of the metallic bed-like thing, and just like that, I was back in my bedroom. I remember standing in my room, but this time with my back facing my window. I stumbled around my room because I was really dizzy, and I remember knocking down some furniture, but finally making it to my bed. The next morning, I woke up. I actually didn't remember any of this. This all came to me later. I woke up feeling extremely sick in my stomach though and I just wanted to throw up. I stumbled down the stairs because I was also extremely hungry. I got the milk out of the fridge and was getting ready to pour it into the box of cereal. I stopped myself though and went over to the sink which faces the backyard. And that was when I saw my dog running around the backyard. The dog who should still have been in my room. That was when it all hit me too. All the memories came back and I ran up the stairs as fast as I could to look at the condition of my room and the furniture was thrown around everywhere. This was around winter time so it got cold and I would sleep with three blankets. And strangely enough, all three blankets were formed into a perfect spiral type design on my bed. I went to the spirals and destroyed them since I couldn't believe what had happened. I was scared if I'm being honest. And... Something changed inside me after that day. I got, I don't know what the right word is, but a dumber in a sense. I had speech problems in which I would stutter after every other word. I also couldn't comprehend what I was reading unless I read it slowly three to four times. I just knew that something happened that night. It wasn't until almost a year later that I was in my room just chilling in my bed. I was at the house alone since my roommate was working. And once again, a bright light shot through my room, but this time, the house began to rumble. It literally felt like an earthquake had struck, and fear struck down my body since I already knew what the light was all about. But this time, the light just went away. The rumbling only lasted for about five seconds, and everything was gone. And after that day, I regained my reading and speaking levels. It all just went back to normal. And that was definitely the weirdest moment in my entire life. Back in 2016, I used to have a pretty considerable online presence on Tumblr and Instagram. I'm not saying I was famous, but I was well known in the circle of fan art, sitting right above 10k followers at the time. I used to have a lot of fun in that community too. It was a great way to spend time and I happened to meet a lot of amazing, inspiring people while I was at it. However, somewhere along the road I got caught in a tornado of just crap in my real life. There were family problems and mental illness, toxic friends, all of it and my mental state was getting worse by the hour and at some point I realized that my art became another draining part of my life since I was just trying to meet the tastes of my followers acting as if it was a job or something. So in a blunt decision I decided to delete my socials and focused on healing myself. For around a year and a half I, I didn't draw at all and I didn't even allow myself to think about my account. As much as I felt a mixture of sadness and nostalgia, I also knew that that was for the best. And it was. I did get a lot better and my problems were gradually solved. Or at least got less complex. And I thought I was well enough to go back to the world of fan art. Remaking was difficult, I must admit, but it went reasonably well. Until the point that I got a DM on Instagram. It was an old follower of mine asking if I owned X account on DeviantArt because my art was being posted there under a different pseudonym. I said no but thanked them for the warning since reposting art was quite constant in my old days. I thought it was just another person plagiarizing artists and oh man, I wish I had been right. I went to the fake page and I was honestly flabbergasted at what I found. Not only did the person pretend to be me, going as far as using my name in my picture, but they also printed out and redrew my old art. 
They continued some series with a clear style discrepancy, which I saw them justify by being just a change in technique, and edited old pieces, adding details and removing colours and features. This had all been going on for months, and by that point, my heart was beating fast in my chest, and I was just so angry that I could barely think straight. In some way, I felt vulnerable as ever, and extremely furious that someone thought that it would be okay to do something like that. It felt like a bit of a sick joke, if I'm being honest. But, still, I sent the person a DM on DeviantArt and said that I was the real artist, and asked politely why did she think that that would be a good idea. Much to my surprise, too, the girl responded within a few minutes, apologizing profusely and saying that she would delete everything, and she did. Now, I was pretty calm by that point. I mean, the problem got solved, right? <sighs> Wrong. After that, she shamelessly tried to befriend me. Rebecca justified her actions by saying that she just wanted to be a great artist like me and didn't think that she would get caught, which just screams bullcrap. She called herself stupid just a billion times and said that she wouldn't do that again. I told her that it didn't excuse her actions and that she'd be happier anyway with herself if she just learned how to create her own style, instead of just pretending to be someone else. Profusely, Rebecca agreed and continued to victimize herself, asking shamelessly if I could be a friend just again and again. I told her that I couldn't befriend someone that did something like that, and stopped replying eventually. Rebecca didn't though. I would wake up with hundreds of messages from her, all in my social media. DMs on Instagram, messages in DA, anonymous on Tumblr. She would send me pictures that she drew of me, clearly copying my style, asking what I thought. Rebecca asked me if I would be a friend more times than I can remember, if I would teach her how to draw, if she could come to visit me one of these days. And my breaking point was when I woke up to her profile, remade on Insta, posting all the pictures of me that she had sent, plus 300 plus messages on DM. And at this point, I just blocked her. And she freaked out. In the course of a couple of weeks, I counted over 15 fake accounts that she made and tried to message me with. Every time, she would use a slight variation of her name, Becky or Rebs and so on, yet acted as if she was a completely different person, meeting me for the first time. The first time it happened, I didn't even realize that it was her, and I felt so stupid after I talked to her for a few days, thinking that she was just a nice fan, until I noticed the consistencies in her speech. No need to say that I was beyond angry and hurt and blocked those accounts just again and again. She wouldn't drop the act after she'd been caught, though instead, she only tried to emotionally manipulate me, crying and asking why I was treating her like that if I didn't even know her. At that point, it's probably no surprise that she knew who my friends were. They started receiving messages about me all the time, flashes of likes from Rebecca and weird dark pictures at least once a day. The girl started messaging them all the time to know more about me, such as my Facebook profile, which I didn't have, or even where I lived. Luckily, I had warned all of them not to trust her, so they just blocked her and ignored her continuous attempts at stalking. Finally, the breaking point, and just for some context, I had returned to my art accounts for about five months then. Five months of this crap happening daily. One account I didn't check often though was Tumblr. When I did, I logged into a few private messages, mostly from actually nice fans, and a lot of anonymous messages. One of the most recent ones was clearly from Rebecca, and as much as I don't remember the details, the message went more or less like this. If you think you're going to get away from this, you're wrong. I'm going to die, and you're the one to blame. You keep ignoring me. I can't live like this. I just want to be you. Why won't you let me? I just want to be you, but I'm too stupid, right? I'm not good enough. And so on and so forth. It honestly sounded like something from a, a real serial killer. As I said, that was the final drop. Quickly after that, I notified my followers that I was going on hiatus and left my accounts for another year untouched, only to return around the end of 2018. 
There were some traces from Becky around, such as a few PMs and fake accounts, but nothing too recent. And thankfully, I think that she may have vanished, for now at least. So this is a recent account of some unsettling events that I went through during my college years, as well as the most amazing example of the bro sixth sense that I've ever witnessed. And so, without further ado, meet Kevin. Kevin was a colleague of mine and was in the same group as me, which meant that he had maybe five to six subjects per year together, and Kevin was just odd. Not that there was something wrong with him physically, he was adorable, a bit nerdy, a bit on the shorter, scrawny side with blonde hair, big blue eyes, and like three fluffy hairs on his chin, I think, instead of facial hair. If I had to compare him to something, I'd say he looked like a, a cute soft baby chicken or something. If baby chickens were mentally inclined to grow into serial killers, that is. More on that later, though. So at first, I honestly didn't really notice him. There were a lot of people in my class, everything was new, and I personally didn't know anyone, except for a guy named Harper who I knew from my sports days, as we often competed against each other, exchanged colourful insults on the track, and then go and get drinks together. Harper will be important later on. So, as I've said, I only knew Harper there, and there were only six other girls in my class, as I've attended classes that held little interest among the female college population. During that time, I made friends and got really chummy with three more geeky guys, Zachary, whom I even casually dated for a short time, Steve, we realized that our mothers went to college together too, equals instant friendship, right, and Rick, with whom I shared many interests. So, to count it down, important guys so far, Harper, a former sports competition adversary, Zachary, kind of casually went out with for a bit, Steve, chill guy, insta friend, Rick, nerd to end all nerds, but a well of interesting trivia and an awesome guy. And these are the important characters because they would later become my personal army. And then there was Kevin. Damn cute Kevin, whom I made the mistake of asking if he had any notes picked up from the first half of a lecture I missed because I overslept. In Kevin speak, hey, got the notes from this morning? Apparently translated into, I have interest in you, oh magnificent Kevin, nothing would make me happier than knowing I've caught your eye, so please, make sure I'm never left without your presence again, for I just can't bear it. I borrowed his notes, partially copied them, and returned his notebook back. What I didn't see was that Kevin then sniffed the notebook when I had my back turned. Zachary noticed it first and sort of snort laughed about it later because my first reaction to it when he told me was to sniff myself and see if I stank or something. I was young and naive then, so the sniffing was less what's wrong with him and more what's wrong with me. And that is where it all went downhill. Over the next few days, Kevin would just always be there, never talking to anyone precisely, just kind of staring at me when we were in class and when we had breaks and went for coffee to the shop outside and then he started showing up for classes that we didn't attend together and said he simply arrived too early for his later classes. But mind you, he never participated, just sat there in the back. Also, Kevin had a sort of aura about him, if that's the right words to use. Like, you don't have to look at the door to know when he entered the room. You just felt his eyes in the back of your head and kind of wished for a shower or something. Anyway, I didn't worry too much until one day I went to the women's bathroom during a break. I did my business, went to the front section to wash my hands and in came Kevin. I was alone too. Kevin turned, closed the door behind him and locked them. Needless to say, I was confused and unsure what to do. So I just stared at him and asked him if he needed something. Hi, he said, then proceeded with, how are you? Like, he hadn't just locked himself in the women's bathroom with me for no fathomable reason. I realized then that something was very, very wrong and attempted not to panic, managing to keep a nonchalant expression and turn towards the mirror so I could still see him and pretend to fix my makeup. Fine, I said, and spoke no more. I could see Kevin fidgeting, playing with the key nervously, and 
And after a long and uncomfortable silence, an eternity really, I heard loud banging from the other side of the door. It was Harper and Steve. Harper yelling something like, Kevin, get your scrawny butt over here and open that door, or I swear to God in the next 10 seconds, the door ain't going to be the only thing I'm breaking. I could hear Steve behind him sounding a bit panicked, telling him to move since he managed to get the spare key. Kevin paled at this and stepped away, the key he had falling somewhere to the floor. Steve and Harper unlocked the door and Harper jumped on Kevin like a damn primate and knocked him down to the floor while Steve and Rick, who was there as well, got inside and all but dragged me out of the bathroom area. None of them wanted to tell me what or why or how any of that happened, but I pushed at the weakest link, Rick, when we were alone and found out that the whole hour prior to all of that, Rick overheard Kevin asking one of the on-campus students, the guys who get some extra cash if they help with paperwork, fixing and cleaning the campus, for the lady's bathroom key and paying him for it. Rick obviously didn't know why the hell Kevin would need that key, but knew that Kevin was a weirdo, so he figured it couldn't be good. Later on, Steve was looking for me and asked Rick if he had seen me, and stuff kind of clicked for Rick. They asked around, and people told them that they saw me go to the bathroom area, and I hadn't come out yet. More confirmed, too, that they saw Kevin going there, too, and joked that we must have a makeout session. Steve immediately connected dots. Harper overheard him talking to Rick and they went to break me free from Kevin's affections while Steve ran to get the extra key from the janitor. Kevin appeared, Kevin appeared with a lightly black eye in class two days later and just wishing to forget the whole thing I pretended that he didn't exist. And boy do I wish that that was the end of it. But maybe a week or two went by. I figured that he must have learned his lesson by now because he was leaving me alone. But then he got the wind in his sails back for some reason and proceeded with attempting to sit next to me in class. He was so insistent that Zachary got involved and now the guys, Harper, Zachary, Steve and Rick, made a timetable so two and two would attend classes at all times when I was there so each could sit on either side of me. I never asked for any of this by the way, they just insisted that they do it. After a few failed attempts, Kevin finally gave up and just settled for sitting in the back, glaring at my back and the two guys on duty that day. And again, I wish that this was the end of it. Two weeks of that later, Kevin either didn't show up for class or just left early. I hoped that he found some other interest and that it was finally over, but it wasn't. I noticed Kevin was now following me to the bus station. It just took one time to see him standing inconspicuously behind the newspaper stand to freak out and call Steve as he lived nearby. Steve picked me up and drove me home that day. The next morning, Harper called me around 9am and went, Are you in my class at 10am today? Yeah. And he said, Pack your crap and wait for me at the end of your street. Kevin is waiting for you at the bus station. Steve just called me. And this went on for some five days, as the guys extended their bro services to now accompany me literally at all times before, during, and even after class. And just to point out yet again too, I really am eternally grateful for it. These four dude bros of mine were like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All business and vengeance, and it was amazing and have probably saved me from a lot more problems with cute Kevin. That day too, Kevin showed up to class looking somewhat roughed up but now stared at me with so much hate that I could barely cope and finally, after some sound advice from Harper and Rick, decided to bring this stuff to the college authorities. The pro dean immediately transferred Kevin to a completely different group so our classes never overlapped again. I stopped seeing Kevin all the time and reached my final year in college. By now, Zachary and Steve moved away, Harper finished it early and no longer attended classes so it was only me and Rick now but it was okay because Kevin was no longer there. Rick and I eventually finished college and graduated and decided to celebrate by visiting a medieval fair in Rick's hometown that summer. We agreed to get some drinks too for old times sake. All was well and we had a great time as we toured the fair a bit and suddenly Rick the sweet, polite Rick goes, Son of a bitch, ain't that Kevin? And it was Kevin. 
just staring at us and then turns on his heels and leaves. We saw him a few more times too and I started to panic thinking that he was following me again. So Rick was already dialing a few of his friends to come over but Kevin suddenly got lost and after that I never saw him again. I had not long been awake when a loud knock sounded from our front door. As I stood on the landing, I could hear my mother open the door and begin joking with whoever was there. I couldn't make out much of the conversation, it didn't concern me too much anyway, but according to my mother, he had a parcel for us and wanted her to sign for it. He didn't have a pen, so she began to close the door so that she could go and fetch one, when suddenly I heard my mother scream loudly. And there was a man's voice shouting too, police, police, this is a raid. I was so shocked that I ran halfway down the stairs to see what was going on. I could see a man in his 50s with short hair and a beard wearing a fluorescent orange vest. He was standing almost in our doorway. My mother was screaming trying to shove him out and he was clearly no police officer. The instinct kicked in and I threw myself down the stairs and against the door. My mother repeatedly hit the man in an attempt to shove him out. I screamed as loud as I could to try and attract attention, but nobody came to our aid. We managed to shove him out of the door with our combined force, and we had the door almost shut when suddenly a large shove threw it back open. I was thrown back and my hip collided with the corner on our electric meter cupboard behind the door, and before I knew it, there were two men. The orange vest wearing man and another dressed in a black coat that obscured most of his face. In a blur of screaming and hitting and shoving on the door, we managed to get them out again. My mother realized that they wanted the fake parcel back, so she picked it up and threw it at their heads. This time, instead of trying for our door again, they hurried off around the corner of the street. Once the door was locked, I asked my mother if she was alright. Both of us, though, were shaking and could barely breathe. We could have called the police right away, but the first thing we did instead was to call my dad. I was in complete shock, concerned mostly about my mother, who was crying on the phone. My dad came home from work immediately and came in to see us while we called the police. It wasn't until the police arrived that I finally just broke down crying. We put in a report and gave statements. The police couldn't find any fingerprints on our door despite everything that had happened. We gave them the CCTV footage from our front window, but it didn't get everything. It did get a good shot of their faces though, but we couldn't stay in the house after that. Every time there was a knock at the door, I would feel so afraid that I would start crying hysterically. And so we moved out about a month later. Even now, three years later, I'm still suffering after this event. Knocks on the door make my heart pound in my chest, though I now have the courage to answer at least. I'm always afraid, though, that it'll happen again, and every time I see someone wearing a fluorescent vest, I get so scared that I just start to shake. Also, the police, they did nothing pretty much. Despite the fact, too, that my mother broke three fingers in the scuffle and I came away with bruises. Our case was shelved after six months and we still have no idea why they chose us. We don't know what they had planned or why they were there or what the heck was in that box and I still feel ill every time that I think about what could have happened to us if they had succeeded in getting into our house. So this happened to me about three years ago but I'll start with a bit of context. I was chosen to go to an exchange trip to Estonia as a part of my music course at college. During the trip, everyone was to be allocated into bands. In these bands, we would write music together and get the opportunity to record our songs at high-class music studios. Anyway, the day of the recording session had come and I was the bassist for the last band that got to record that day, so I spent most of the day at the hotel where all the international students stayed. I shared my room with two other students who came from my college and they both had early recording sessions booked. By the time I was packing my equipment to leave for the studio, most of the students had started coming back. The studio was only a short walk away so I got directions from one of the students and made my way there. After about three hours at the studio, I started to make my way back to the hotel. 
As I rounded the corner into the hotel street, I took my phone out and looked up a good album to listen to when I got back to my room. I had my head down at my phone, music blasting from my headphones and wasn't really paying any attention. As I entered the hotel, I took my headphones out and made my way to my room. And I noticed that it was just really quiet. This was really strange, especially as the hotel was right in the middle of the city. I got to my room and tried to open my door, but it was locked. I was told by my roommates that they would be back by this time, that they would leave the door open for me. I looked everywhere for my keys, but I had left them in the room, so I got out my phone and began to text one of my roommates. And the conversation went something like this. Hey, I'm back at the hotel, but the doors are locked. I thought that you guys said you would be in. You're in the hotel? Uh, yeah, but I don't have my keys. When are you guys back? Dude, you have to get out of there. Now. What? Why? Just get out. At this point, I started receiving messages from the other students telling me to get out and it's not safe. I was so confused and for a minute I thought it was just a big joke. But then I got one of the most terrifying phone calls of my life. One of the lecturers at the college who came on the exchange phoned me. He told me that the hotel had been evacuated because a guy staying on the other side of the hotel was running around with a handmade knife trying to attack students. Which meant that the whole hotel was empty apart from me and this crazy person. At that point, reality hit hard. I was trapped on the top floor and I couldn't even lock myself in my room. I had to make my way back down and out quickly, so I hung up and I started to move. The hotel had no elevator, so I slowly made my way around, listening for any sounds, peeking my head around corners to make sure it was safe. My adrenaline was super high and every creak of the floor made me grip my teeth. By the time I made it to the stairs, I felt sick with fear. I stopped caring about making noises eventually and just started running down the stairs. I just wanted to get out of there and I felt like it was taking hours just to clear a single flight. Eventually, I got to the first floor and could see the reception area. Freedom from this nightmare was so close. However, as I made my way down, somebody walked around the corner, stopped at the bottom of the stairs. I noticed the figure and I stopped dead in my tracks. It was a middle-aged man with short dark hair, topless, covered in what looked like oil or grease or something, holding in his hand a filthy rag covering something underneath it. As he turned his hand slowly, I saw the handle, and it was a knife. We locked eyes, and my blood ran ice cold. I wanted to run, but fear glued me in place. A thousand scenarios ran through my head at once. What if he charges at me? What if he gets to me? What should I do? We just keep staring at each other though. Someone's got to make the first move in this situation and I guess it's got to be me. I have to get the upper hand, right? So, what do you think I did? Out of all the options I had and the situations I was in, I did the first thing that came into my head. I smiled, looked at him dead in the eyes, and said in the most friendly voice that I could manage, Hello, nice day, huh? Silence. He said nothing. A second later, he started slowly walking up the stairs. I stood dead still and never took my eyes off him and he kept his head down and started mumbling something to himself. As he walked past me, I could smell the body odor and booze off of him too and he rounded the corner and at that point, I ran. I bolted through the reception and burst out the front entrance. To my right, the street was completely empty and to my left, a large crowd of people staring at me in disbelief. Just a few meters away from me, one of the lecturers had his back pressed to the hotel's wall. He told me to come quickly and I made my way into the crowd where I found all the students and guests gathered. After that, we waited for the man to be escorted out by police and all of us grabbed our things and we found a much nicer and safer hotel for the rest of the trip. I was later told that a few of the crowd saw me walk in and were actually calling to me. I didn't hear or see them because... Well, I stupidly had my earphones in and was staring at my phone. I can only imagine the panic that they must have gone into and the shock to see me run out like that. 
For some reason, I never told my fellow students or lecturers what happened. But when they asked, I just said that I didn't see the guy. For the rest of the trip, the guy in the hotel was nicknamed the Mad Stabber. And I didn't sleep very well for the rest of the trip. Alright, so uh, I personally have had a lot of bad luck and visions lately and I'm just looking for help. But to sum it up, I've owned my house for three years and recently things have been happening. Lights blow out and then I change the lights with the new bulbs and they blow out again. My appliances have been breaking, dishwasher, dryer, refrigerator and then I was in a car accident. I haven't been in one for 14 years. And there are many other occurrences that have happened in the past month in and out of my home too. Out of my house I get taps on my shoulder and see shadows and someone waving from the backseat of my car through my rearview mirror. One night, I heard someone walk down my hallway, stop at my door, and then just walk away. I've also been having nightmares of battling a black cloud in my dreams and continuously reciting scriptures to keep it at bay. Today, I finally got my home camera working. It randomly died out a week ago. The video isn't great, but I was putting food in the microwave, then washed my hands, and I pet my dog, and from directly behind my head, I heard a loud growl or deep cough, and... It chilled me to my bones, but I kept my composure and ignored it and pretended that it was my pup. It was not my dog though, because I was staring right at her when the noise came from behind me in the kitchen. Someone I talked to suggested that maybe someone has cursed me, but I don't really know anyone who would do that. I'm just looking for answers though, but here's the video. So this happened when I was around 10. I live in a relatively small country and it only took a couple of hours drive to get from my house to my aunt's in another country. We were driving a country road when this battered looking minivan started driving in front of us at a roundabout. We were the only two cars on the road. There were some gardening tools and a tarp in the back of the window. It was clear the driver was either drunk, high or just an absolute idiot. They were repeatedly swerving out of their lane like they were a video game protagonist or something. It was a hot day, so both of our cars had the windows down so we could hear what sounded like a, a sermon blasting from their radio. We drove behind them for roughly seven minutes with my mum muttering about the state of the country. The minivan abruptly stopped in the middle of the road, which ticked off my mum. The driver did an illegal U-turn during which two things happened. I saw the driver's face... He was a skinny middle-aged man with dirty yellow hair and a beard and we both got a good look at each other's license plates. The driver turned into the opposite lane and drove past us, heading back into the hall, still driving erratically and almost hitting us. After he was gone, my mum pulled over and called the police to report him, giving them his license plate and a description of his appearance. The cop thanked us and promised to get right onto it. Then, we were nearly home and my mum got a call from the guards where they told her that they had arrested the guy who had warrants for drug dealing and domestic abuse. My mum was thanked and we all joked about her being a hero over pizza that night. Cut to a few weeks later when school had started up again, I had gone with my dad to the hardware store. While my dad was at the checkout, I was looking out at the parking lot when I saw the battered minivan driving out of the lot. I didn't see the driver though, so I convinced myself it was only a coincidence, although my dad noticed that I seemed uneasy for the rest of the night. A few days later, my mum came home early from work looking like she had just run a marathon. She gave me and my brothers tight hugs and we were sent to bed earlier than usual that night. And I didn't learn about this next part until last year. The reason my mum was acting so weird is because her secretary had reported seeing a strange man inspecting the license plates of my mum's car. My mum asked what the man looked like and froze when she was given the description of the guy that we had reported. That weekend, my mum didn't want any of us kids leaving the house, but I was a stubborn little turd and all but demanded to be allowed out for a quick walk around the neighbourhood. While I was out and roughly 15 minutes walk away from my house, a vehicle drove past me and it was the minivan and the same man was in the driver's seat giving me a friendly nod. 
As soon as he was out of sight, I ran back home and told my parents, who immediately bundled us all into my dad's car and drove to stay the night at grandma's. I was put into the guest room but had zero chance of falling asleep so I was wide awake for all the drama that happened that night. My parents called the cops and informed them about the man stalking us. A couple of hours later, a squad car pulled up outside and the officers told my parents everything. When they arrived to our house, they had discovered the front door had been forced open. Some of our nicest possessions had been smashed and were left in shards on the floor. But that's not the worst part. No, the worst part was where the police found the man. In the pantry, holding what a female officer described as the biggest damn knife I've ever seen. We spent the next few days at grandma's while my parents handled the legal business. The man was sentenced to a life in a psychiatric hospital and none of us have ever seen him since. But I dread to think what would have happened had I not gone for a walk that day. I always tell this as a cautionary tale that has actually happened to me especially in light of all the terrifying, heartbreaking news stories of girls who get into Ubers and are just never seen again. So this happened when I was in college. It's one of the bigger party schools with an entire street of bars you can wander to and from. My boyfriend, and now fiancé, had gone back to his hometown for the weekend, so I decided to go out with some friends. I'm sure you can see where this is going, but I had a bit too much to drink and was on the edge of blacking out. Knowing with my whole mind, body and soul though that I did not want to become a liability for my friends for the rest of the night, I told them that I was just going to catch an Uber home. My friends insisted on coming home with me but selfishly I wanted to call my boyfriend when I got home and have a bed to myself so I told them all no but took a screenshot of my driver's name and info on the app and sent it to them. When he got close I hugged them all and I walked out the door. Like I said earlier, it's a pretty big party school with lots of bars in one area, so the entire strip is lined with Ubers from about 11pm to 3 I'd say. It was almost bar close anyway, so there were a ton and look, I was hammered. I don't even know what a Toyota Yaris looks like at the best of times too. So, as I'm searching, a man rolled his window down and asked if I was waiting for an Uber. I said yes, he told me that he wasn't my Uber but if I cancelled my ride and accepted his then he would take me home. I was already thinking of the leftovers that I had in the fridge at this point so I just agreed, cancelled my Uber and linked my account up with his. He was super nice and he was an Uber. I've heard stories of fake Uber drivers so I did make sure that he was legit. He called me beautiful a few times right off the bat but hey... I was a girl in college and I got that a lot. I remember talking about our favourite books. I told him that I was an English major and he was super interested in listening to me talk about tutoring ESL students in my free time on campus. He was an immigrant who had to learn to speak English so we lamented about how awful it was to learn such an intricate language but how rewarding the successes were in the end. And when he missed the turn in for my apartment complex... I figured it must have been because he was distracted by our conversation. I politely pointed out that he missed the turn in and he said that he'd turn back around. Rather than making a U-turn though, he took the longest way back to my apartment. I was still in familiar territory though, so I at least knew that he was going in the right direction, but I was starting to get a little bit nervous, I must admit. It was around 2.30 at this time and it was super dark and no one was awake, let alone outside. When he missed the turn in again though, I asked if I could just get out and make it back on my own. He seemed kind of offended by this, like he was surprised that I wasn't as engrossed in our conversation as he was. I kind of jokingly told him that I was a broke college student and he was racking up my bill during a search. That seemed to straighten things out a bit and he was all, oh I completely understand and turned back toward my complex. I was honestly so freaked out and drunk at this point that as soon as he pulled into my complex, I was like, okay, right here is fine, thank you, and pulled on the door handle when he came to a stop. But it didn't open. I hit the little lock latch and still nothing. And then he said... Let's go get a coffee. 
he clicked the button in the app to say the trip was completed and clicked out of the app. At this point, I'm just trying not to look as freaked out as I feel and I told him that I was tired and it was late and coffee was the last thing I needed at that moment. I tried the door again just to make sure I wasn't drunk and handling the door wrong but still it didn't open. We should just sit here and talk until you're feeling better, he was explaining to me. We can go somewhere more private too, if you'd like. Do you live alone up there? At this point, I'm frantically digging through my purse for my phone, screw being polite. When he asked what I was doing, I told him that I promised my boyfriend that I'd call him once I was home safely. And that was the wrong thing to say. He got pissed that I had a boyfriend and I didn't tell him about it. He asked what his name was and what he did for a living and where he was right now at this very second. When I gave a half-hearted answer, he got even angrier too. He demanded to know why a boyfriend of mine would be so stupid enough to leave his girl alone with another man, him. He repeated it twice too and at this point, I'm just trying not to cry. When I figured my phone must have fallen under the seat, I started digging around down there and he demanded to know what I was doing. I gave my best impression of a genuine laugh and said that I dropped my phone. He told me to stop digging around though in these things immediately and I stopped. Mind you, I'm still drunk as hell at this point. I was just trying to keep my crap together and not vomit or pass out. I tried the door a third time too but still nothing. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again, even kind of begged a little and I told him no, I just needed sleep. He asked if I lived alone again and I lied and told him that I had a roommate. He asked if it was my boyfriend and I said no. He kind of got angry again and then straight up asked if I made my boyfriend up. I told him no and he got angrier and again asked why he would leave me alone with another man like this. Now, I'm usually pretty good at reading people and I got the vibe that this guy thought that he was a knight compared to my boyfriend or something. So, I lied through my teeth. I told him that I was going to break things off with my boyfriend, that we weren't even really that serious, that he was an idiot to leave me alone like this. And thank whatever God was watching over me, but that did it. He calmed down at that and said that that changed things. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again and I changed my answer to not tonight. He asked for my number and I gave it to him. He called to make sure it was my real number too. My phone buzzed from between my seat and the door and I fished it out. He grabbed my phone from me and demanded that I show him my boyfriend's contact info. When I did, he deleted it and gave me a big smile. Feels good, doesn't it? I told him yes. He put his number into my phone and gave it back. I told him goodnight in the hopes that he would just release me and he told me that he'd like to talk for just a little longer. And... I had to stay locked in that car with him until 4.30 in the morning. I honestly don't even remember what we talked about. He asked if he could hold my hand at one point, to which I said I needed to break up with my boyfriend before I did anything with another man. And he seemed to like that answer, thankfully. When he finally did let me out, the door was a child lock so it could only be opened from the outside and the windows were locked too. I walked up the wrong building steps and crouched down in the shadows of some random person's door until he drove off. I sat for another 10 minutes and then I just sprinted to my apartment. After crying on the floor in my kitchen for a while, I called my boyfriend and explained to him what happened. His response was the one that I get from everyone when I tell this story. Report the guy to Uber. But even though he didn't know which building in my complex I lived in... He still knew where I lived and I was terrified of seeing him again. I was terrified of calling an Uber and to this day I refuse to Uber alone and I make sure that I have my phone in my hand every time I get into an Uber now. I realize that this could have been a lot worse and who knows maybe he was a good guy with the wrong line of thinking and he did actually mean well but I was terrified that I wasn't going to make it to my apartment that night. So please, be cautious when getting an Uber, and don't be like me. This happened in the mid to late 80s. 
I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old at the time and it was summertime and my mother and I were at my grandmother's house in St. Albans, Queens for a barbecue. Like most houses in this area, my grandmother's house was fairly close to her neighbours. It's mid-afternoon and the adults had all been drinking for a few hours and were laughing about things that I was just too young to understand. I was sitting in the backyard playing with my Transformer toys when something in the second floor window of the neighbour's home caught my eye. It was a, a hand puppet. But at the time, the Muppets were so popular that I thought any sort of puppet was a Muppet. Anyway, the puppet began to move and wave at me and I laughed and asked my mother to look at the window. She and the other adults looked and began to laugh and yelled at the window. You still play with those dolls, Larry? I only say his name was Larry because I can't for the life of me remember the name that they called him. Larry then came into view in the window and the Muppet was obviously on his right hand. Looking back on it, he was probably in his early 30s or late 20s I'd say, considering my mum and uncles knew him too. He waved at everyone and then just walked out of view. Now, at that age, I thought that any adult that played with toys or video games was really cool, but I'd never seen one who had a Muppet. I figured that he was a ventriloquist and was excited at the idea of him coming outside with a puppet and doing a show for us. The barbecue went on and I kept glancing at the window hoping to get another look at the puppet, but I guess Larry had put on enough of a show for one day. The barbecue proceeded as usual and by the evening people were beginning to leave while others went to get more alcohol. My mother told me that we were staying at grandma's tonight because she didn't want to drive home. I began to feel tired so I went down into the basement to get into the pullout bed that I slept in when we stayed overnight. The basement had several rectangular shaped windows that were placed right below the basement ceiling. My cousins and I liked to look out these windows, so we had to climb on furniture and because the windows were so low to the ground on the outside, we could spy on what was happening around the house without being detected. I turned off all the lights in the basement and climbed into bed. The adults all seemed to be upstairs in the kitchen and the living room and once I heard music playing, I knew it was going to be one of those nights. I was in bed and nearly asleep when, in my peripheral vision... I detected something outside the basement window, across from me, peering down at me. Once my eyes adjusted a bit, I could make out the white and bulbous shaped eyes right above an unnatural wide smile. I was obviously petrified, but after a few seconds I realized that this was the Muppet from earlier in the day. This didn't exactly give me any sense of relief, because now I'm trying to determine how the hell the Muppet from the neighbor's house got outside and was looking into my grandma's window. My uncles were at the barbecue and they actually took delight in running these kinds of jokes on me so I figured one of them got the Muppet from Larry and was trying to scare the crap out of me. And just as I was about to go upstairs to get my mum, the damn thing tapped the window. And the same smile and unblinking eyes staring at me. But now its three-fingered cartoonish hand was tapping the window resulting in a, a sort of muffled thud and it was really creepy. I'll admit that when I initially saw this thing staring down at me, I was too scared to move, but once it started tapping the glass, my instinct to scream for my mother kicked way in. I opened my mouth and just as I was about to scream with everything that I had, Larry came into view out of the corner of the window. He must have been laying down on the driveway with the puppet on his hand and he put a finger to his lip indicating for me to be quiet and gestured for me to come outside with his left hand. This was so freaky and any notion of Larry being a cool guy was now way out the window. I got out of bed and was walking upstairs to find my mum or grandmother, whichever was less intoxicated. I looked back at the window prior to ascending the stairs and both the puppet and Larry were just staring at me. That frozen smile on the puppet and the eerie look of excitement on Larry's face still unnerves me to this day. So I ran upstairs and found my mother going through records looking for something to play. When my mother was drinking, she could be in any number of moods. I didn't know whether she'd be annoyed at me or make me dance with her to whatever song was playing. Thankfully, she wasn't quite drunk yet and heard what I had to say. After I finished telling her what happened, she told me to stay in the living room while she took a look outside. She got one of my uncles to go with her and they both left out the back door. Several minutes passed and neither one came back inside. I went to the door and heard my mother and uncle talking. 
I cracked the door open and saw that they were smoking cigarettes and I said, Hey mum, in a way that only a kid can when he or she wants something but is afraid to annoy their parents. And she said, baby, with a very short response of, there's no one out there, you must have imagined it. I asked if I could sleep upstairs in my aunt's room and my mother said that I could that night. As I closed the door, I heard my uncle ask if I had a bad dream and my mum responded that I always want attention when she's with people. And that was my cue that she was annoyed and I had best not bother her anymore tonight. So I went upstairs to my aunt's room, which was actually a large closet that had been converted into a small bedroom, and I got under the covers praying that Larry didn't come to get me. Thankfully, there were no windows in that room. So, the years passed and every time I was at my grandma's I'd glance at the neighbor's window for any sign of that Muppet. About a decade later I was at my grandmother's house helping her to do chores when I asked her about the guy next door with the puppet. She responded with who? And I asked, you don't remember the guy next door that had the puppet in the window that one day? She thought for a while before saying, oh yeah, Larry... He hasn't been here in a long time. He got in trouble for doing something to his younger cousin and he moved down south. And I was suddenly that scared little boy lying in bed in my grandmother's basement staring at two sets of eyes, staring at me, wondering what the hell would have happened had I gone outside that night. Thankfully, I'll never know. My senior year of high school, I started talking with this super good looking emo punk kid named Brian on AIM, and I was all in. I had just been dumped by my loser HS boyfriend, and Brian was incredibly sweet and always knew what to say. There were some red flags for sure, whenever I would finally convince him to send me a picture, he looked uh, a little different in each photo. Like, it could have been pictures of different people, but it looked similar enough and the guy liner was on point, so I just accepted it. We also never talked on the phone. I would beg him to let me call him, but he always would have an excuse. Finally, the summer before I left for college, he let me call him and his voice was just super weird. My friend was convinced that it was like a 50-year-old woman, but I was like, hell no, this is Brian. I was so blinded that I just ignored every warning sign, and I told him everything. He knew all of my passwords, everything about my day-to-day -day life, literally every single one of my friends told me that he wasn't real, that I needed to stop being a dumbass, but I honestly loved him. That fall, I left for college, and my first roommate was a total winebag who had a mile-long list of rules for the room. No boys ever allowed in, I wasn't allowed to touch her Left Behind series that she proudly displayed, no guests after eight, etc. So I was desperate to bounce. I found out that there was an empty room and requested a transfer for winter semester. I knew going in blind was a risk, but it couldn't be worse than Left Behind chick. At the same time, I was loving everything else about the college though. Things with Brian kind of waned because, well, life is busy and I wanted to experience everything, aka other dudes. He would call me 20 times a day, message me all the time, constantly barrage me about whether or not I had a Facebook account and wanted the password to it. Hell no, though. And finally, I broke things off for good. The next semester, I moved into my awesome new room. My roommate is a fellow freshman from MA who transferred that semester. She was loaded, brought basically everything we would both need for the room. Her mum even got us matching bedding from Pottery Barn, and it was awesome. She was a little weird and like, always wanted to hang out the first week, but I figured it was just nerves. The first weekend after classes started, I was chilling with some friends in the quad area, and she comes over and throws her keys at me and is like, having fun with these losers? I was like, what the hell is going on? And I ended up sleeping at one of my girlfriend's rooms that night because I was super freaked out. And the next day, it was like nothing happened. We hung out that whole week. She was very perceptive and helpful. I was amped to have met what I thought was my college bestie. The next weekend, I convinced her to come out and we're having a blast, dancing with dudes, and then things were escalating with me and soccer jocks, so I let her know that I was bailing. 
We were a two minute walk from the soccer house and came with a group so I figured no big deal. I get back to the room later that night and I see that just everything is torn up. Clothes ripped out of the closet, stuff all over the floor. She's sitting on my bed and her arm is bleeding. I ask her what the heck's going on and she had broken my coffee cup and carved my initials in her arm. I run and get the RA because I'm not trying to get murdered, obviously. She ended up getting committed that night and her parents flew down and this is where things got really weird. She was actually Brian. She told her parents and they told me. She had allegedly tried to start things with me as, like her true self, applied to my school and called the housing department to request me as a roommate emailing housing from my email and requested her as my roommate and then deleted all the emails. Her parents apologized and said that I could keep all the stuff in the room. They withdrew her from the classes and then left. I got a no contact order and it was the craziest story of my life. This happened in high school over 15 years ago. I was a 14 to 15 year old male at the time. I've only ever had one experience like this and I do believe that it was random. So I grew up in an old two story modest home with my mum in a small town in mid Missouri. My bedroom was upstairs and rectangular in shape. It was long, spanning most of the length of the house. On one end was a window facing the street and on the other end was the bedroom door. My bed was near the window side of the room. So that particular evening, I was up late watching some random shows in my room. I remember feeling uneasy though. Something just didn't feel right, but I couldn't pinpoint what. It had been an uneventful day, so eventually I just got bored with the TV, crawled into bed, and somehow I just fell asleep. Instantly though, I awoke and just shot straight up in bed. A crippling sense of dread consumed me. I was terrified and just couldn't explain why. And... What really worried me was feeling that way in my own room, a familiar place where I'd always felt very safe. But for some reason, not that night. I felt like I just wasn't alone. I must have been sitting upright for 15 to 20 seconds before swinging my legs over toward the right side of the bed. I purposely kept my eyes low on my legs in the floor and then, after several long seconds, which felt like an eternity, I slowly glanced upward toward the other end of the long room. It was mostly dark except for a small amount of light from the dim street lamp outside that penetrated through the closed blinds behind me. This light provided just enough illumination to barely make out the layout of the room. And in front of me, halfway between my bed and the door, stood a dark, featureless, human-like shaped silhouette. But when my eyes glimpsed it, I honestly felt petrified and my first thought was to curl up fetal style underneath the blankets and hope that whatever it was would just go away. It was just a paralyzing fear, and I quickly rationalized that hiding under the blankets wouldn't get me away from whatever this thing was. I needed to get out of the room, and directly through it was the only way. I mustered up whatever courage I had, shakily stood up on both feet, and bolted toward the door to escape. While passing through it... I just felt the coldest sensation throughout my entire body and every hair stood up straight which made me run even faster. I got to the door, swung it open and flew down the stairs and I stayed down there for some time while trying to process what the hell just happened. I then went to the living room where our family dog Trixie, a Rottweiler Pitbull mix, was sleeping in the kennel. I got her out, leashed her and cautiously walked to the base of the stairs that led up to my room. I don't recall her acting weird or noticing anything, but I still felt something was up there, so we slept on the living room couch the rest of the night. And that was my only possible paranormal experience that I've ever had. Now, I didn't feel physically threatened by it, like my life was in danger or anything, but definitely got the feeling that I was unwanted, as if I had trespassed onto someone else's property and needed to get out now. Also, uh, a couple of other things. My dog slept in my room often at night, but for whatever reason she was in the kennel that evening. I often wonder if she would have actually alerted me if she'd been in the room or not. Also, when I initially awoke, it felt like only minutes had passed since going to bed, but I'd actually been asleep for about two to three hours. 
The home is located at 702 North Clark in Mexico, M.O. You can Google map it if you want, because it's the home of the grey roof and the very light green, almost white-coloured siding. It has cement stairs along the side, and the house used to have a large tree in the front yard that made it look a little creepy at night. The window to my old room is the upper left one. The other upstairs windows are a part of another bedroom. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys.